Well, hey there, guys, gals, and non-binary pals, and welcome to the last day of the regular season here in Season 9. This is the last day of Phase 3 before the playoffs kick off, and the last day of just regular old Smite. From here on out, it's postseason, it's playoffs, it's the World Championship, a lot of stuff like that. And of course, I have to thank Prime Gaming for powering all of this, right, for bringing you uh, the Season 9 of the SBL, because they've, they've not only enabled this, but they've enabled a lot of fun things, at least for me personally, a lot of free games, a free Twitch sub that I can use every month, and of course you have access to that as well. If you're a Prime Gaming subscriber, then uh, there's a little crown like right up there, you should click on that. It's going to show you a lot of very helpful things, whether it's going to be, as I said, free games, or that free Twitch sub, which you can use down there, or just in-game content for a lot of various games. Of course, Smite and Paladins always have a bunch of skins on there as well, so you want to make sure that you're, you're capitalizing on that. And if you're not a Prime Gaming subscriber, you should probably become one because of all those things I just said. They're all really, really helpful. Plus, you get a lot more than that, like the free Amazon delivery and more. So, thanks to Prime Gaming for powering the SBL here in Season 9. Of course, thanks to Mifflin for sitting on the desk with me here for set number one. We are on the last day, Mifflin. And there is technically, like, technically a standings thing that can change. I'm curious to see how these teams uh, approach today because yesterday we got, we got a little silly. Yeah, I mean... To be sure, the Oni Warriors are taking these sets seriously, right? Yeah. I mean, when money's on the line, when seating's on the line, you want to at least give yourself the best foot forward. Yeah. The Oni Warriors have the opportunity to switch spots with the Tartarus Titans, yeah. so maybe the Titans also take it pretty serious. Camelot Kings, though, they're, 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 they're hard stuck third. Yeah. And that's uh, that's the thing to talk about, right? We're looking at the, the grand scheme road to Worlds, where these teams are going to be headed. And, of course, the, the first stop, for all of them after this, it, well, not all of them, for the first stop for the top six is those phase three playoffs. And, and again, kind of talking about specifically this one, uh, you're looking at the Titans, who I believe right now are in fifth. We're talking uh, Warriors and the second set, who are fourth. They can swap. Fourth and fifth seed from this phase play each other at the playoffs. So it's not necessarily going to change who your matchup is, but like you said, uh, some, of the, some of that precious phase three regular season money on God, the line. I love money. Uh, and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don't we all, man? And then a little later throughout this year, so uh, if you're wondering right now, it's the 20th. Ten days from now is when the Phase 3 playoffs kick off. And then a week later, we'll have uh, the... the My brain just froze for a second there. It's right in front of you me, got quite it, you literally. Got it. The Road to Worlds Let's go. for Europe and the SOC, SCC SOC teams that are going to move forward from there, as well as then the week later, uh, the Road to Worlds for the North American SCC SOC teams. And then at the beginning of January, after a couple of weeks off for the holidays, we will see those teams take on the four teams that did not qualify, either from playoffs or from Phase 3. So we'll see the Scarabs, the Valkyries there, and whatever teams don't make it from the SBL into the playoffs. They'll go up against those SCC SOC teams. Top four of that, go to the World Championship, and we're live in Arlington. And the fact that it's getting much, much closer, it's feeling really, really solid to me. But Mifflin, first we got to make it through today before any of that even happens. So we can look at today's schedule and standings. Again, it's been an interesting week, long Thursday, and then some 2-0s Friday and Saturday to really solidify things. Bolts win yesterday, Warriors win yesterday. And we'll see what they have to offer today. The Titans taking on the Kings is what we're kicking things off with. Scarabs Warriors is second. And then at the very end of the day, the Valkyries taking on the Bolts. At that point, really just for some funsies, the Valkyries don't have a chance to, to do too much. I guess they could theoretically, depending on how the Scarabs set goes, that 7th, 8th seed changes. But again, uh, grand scheme, at least for, for playoffs, no opportunities for either of those teams. Bolts are, are pretty much locked in where they are. As you had mentioned, Kings locked in where they are. Only swaps that can happen is right there at four and five. And I, I really think it is a significant change. Any time money is involved, yeah. I mean, maybe the mindset's changed since back in my day, but I'll fight tooth and nail for five dollars. You know what I mean? And they're, and <laughs> and they're fighting over <laughs> way more than that. So I, I'm expecting some pretty decent matches. Yeah, I'm excited to see what they have to offer today. There's also a chance uh, I, I will, um, and maybe this is going to be something that uh, Roar like will look at. But I know he was messaging me about gods he's played versus gods he hasn't played. Uh, so I'm excited to see what that kind of conversation. I just I sent him a full screen cap of, hey, here's everything you've played competitively, and he just gave me a thumbs up. We'll see what that ends up resulting in, uh, whether it's trying to up some of those win rates, maybe kind of uh, maybe surprise us with something. Who knows what we're going to get out of them? But the team they're playing today, again, you had kind of mentioned it, the Kings, who are locked in at third, have been playing incredibly well, and recently with a change, 
feel like they are maybe back on the path that, that they wanted to be on in order to win a championship. Yeah, and I think the Kings are, are interesting when you take into account their full trajectory throughout the year. When we talk about Phase 1 regular season, it wasn't the best performance from them. They got to bring it back a little bit during Phase 1 playoffs. I believe that was Smite Masters 1. They b- play second. Phase 2, dominant phase from the Camelot Kings. They, they look like the current Leviathans in that they were, I think, only dropping one set throughout the entirety of that phase. And then they get second at Phase 2 playoffs uh, again. So now in Phase 3... When you compare it to Phase 2, maybe not as dominant as they would like. They start off this phase a little bit weaker, but as it has gone on, they've developed the, develop their meta very, very well, and, and they're starting to gear up once more as we get closer to the Worlds. Yeah. I've got expectations for this team, but the Twig curse seems to be running pretty strong. <laughs> well, that was the, the interesting thing, was, was, you know, and we actually had an interview with Twig the other day where he said, yeah, I've been in a slump for like a month, and then he's like, and I, I was not happy with it, and to get back on to, to the games they had the other day, it felt really, really solid. And so if the rest of the team is kind of on that same beat, you know, getting out of a slump, kind of feeling refreshed, especially going into the postseason, you have to imagine that feels really good, but you don't have to take it from me. We've actually got Genetics standing by with Dolson for an interview. That's right. i got Genetics support of the Camelot Kings here with me. And, and Genetics, you guys locked in third seed. Uh, what are you hoping to gain from the matchup here today? Uh, nothing. I want to have <laughs> I want to have fun, but um, it's actually fair for us to try because it affects the seeding, the standings for the rest of the team. So we won't be trolling, but we won't be. Well, I won't be trying that hard, but we'll be trying. We'll be trying enough. Fair enough. Um, going up against the Titans today, and and really the the recent change with your roster, you bring Yark over to ADC. Uh, how have things been going? You two over in the duo, and you feel like synergy's built up relatively quickly. Uh, yeah, I love the guy. Uh, and he's, he's really fun to work with. Um, I've been playing loads of rank with him as well, which is kind of funny. Um, it's just good to play with your teammates in ranked, and it's, it's been uh, a blast so far. MMR has been helped by having Yark around? No, because I didn't queue them last night, so he's <laughs> taken it all back off me again, so right. I'm back to zero. But Yeah, unlucky. Well, actually, on totally side note to this set here today, but it made me think about it. Um, wrong, you played the Artemis support yesterday. Oh, yeah. um, Give me the history with, with you and the Artemis support, because you, you took that as a slight. And so for those who might not be aware, um, what's the story there? The thing is, I'm experimental. And the two picks that I'd like to put my name down as is the Artemis and the Honor support guy. And he's played the Artemis yesterday. So I want to play the Honor today, but uh, uh, my team is they're threatening me. Fair enough. Uh, did you approve of the outcome? I mean, obviously, they didn't win. The Leviathans didn't win those sets. Do you think he did the Artem- wrong? You did the Artemis support justice? or? You think you, you could get a bit more out of it? Well, I copied my build to a T, <laughs> so uh, the Kin's on Artemis and the Heavy Axion on her with the Bling Sunder. He's done a good job copying. Right. Uh, look, the, the Titans, they have been uh, a very innovative team as well. Um, you mention it. Standings and, and money-wise for them, still pretty motivated. Um, going up against the Titans specifically, do you as a team feel like you have to prepare a bit extra for, for strange things and picks and bans, or do you feel like you got them figured out at this point in the year? Uh, it's very hard figuring out a solo troll. Uh, usually, Paul and Aurora are pretty easy to figure out, but now they're just, they're just a really good solid team when they're playing in form. It's not they're not like they don't whip out random random stuff. They just play well every game. We'll see if the uh, the on her support wins the day. Uh, that's been genetics. Thanks for your time. Best of luck. We'll head back to the desk to start it off. We'll see if we get the on her support. I might have even said his team was threatening. <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> it's friendly banter, right? Yeah. Threatening well, uh, over like, well, an EU is different. And, like, he's threatening to play on her support. So, like, I could understand a little bit of a threatening yeah. something nature back. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see what the, the Kings pull out for us today. And Mifflin, uh, that actually leads to this. Because listening to genetics, he says that they, they're going to take it mostly seriously just because of the fact that there's still standings implications, things like that. But that does lead into the Titans conversation. Which my question is for you. I mean, I mean, like Stu seems like a guy who would who would wouldn't mind relaxing and having fun sometimes. But also, I could see him, Aurora, and Paul being like super serious. Uh, Aurora is also a wild card sometimes, so you never know. But I feel like Solar Troll and Layers are definitely of the 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 fabric of the kind of people who would see the fun. You can that call was them that trolls. Yesterday. Just call them trolls. Man. It's, it's say what literally you insane. Well, yeah. Well, like they're they they do a little trolling every now and then. Yeah, ha- having had experience playing against Aurora in the past, I would say that he is one of the most serious players on game day that Smite has ever seen. Yeah. Uh, I don't think Aurora has ever once taken an L, troll or otherwise, and said, okay, I'm fine with that. Yeah. You know, it, it is 
uh, it is really serious for him to to want to <laughs> take a dub at the end. So I wouldn't be surprised if the Tartarus Titans come out swinging. Uh, I am of the personal belief that if any one individual member of your team wants to take a set seriously, you, you as a teammate, do it. you you have a responsibility to take it seriously. Yeah. If you want to troll, you you all have to be on board because the second one person doesn't want to. I mean, there's, there's going to be arguments, and you really yeah. don't want that going into the end of the year. So I expect good things from the Tartarus Titans. Uh, of course, they want to defend their seating. Uh, I, I expect pretty standard play across the board. Unless, like, you know, there, there is that argument of Aurora not being able to convince his team to, to put forth a, a general effort. That's uh, honestly going to be interesting. And I will say, uh, especially because of what you said, it is not someone, he's, he's not necessarily one to not partake. In a, in a troll game, and well, let's just call it a fun game uh, in general. Mainly because if I go to a Roar's page and I sort by win rate, uh, it's a lot of gods that he's only played like once or, or up to four times for some reason for Hell. Uh, but Hell, Naja, Uller, the Naja maybe makes a little more sense, although not necessarily something that we've seen in support for quite a while, and even then, not something that a Roar played a lot. Uh, but the, his top two are going to be Uller and Pele because he's got a 16 KDA on Pele from a game last year that in a, in a much less mattering game, which is wild because like there's only a small shift that this one can make. Uh, that one meant nothing for them. So he played Pele and absolutely ran through the other team. It was wild. He was like 10 and 0 at one point. Uh, so uh, we know that he can do it. The question right now is just whether or not they will, or if, if like you said, we're going to be seeing uh, some pretty box standard smite, which honestly, Right before playoffs, this is always the weirdest time to do it as well because, like, there's still enough on the line that it's worth trying, but not so much that you want to pull out any new strategies or new god picks that you think are, are going to be, like, you know, the next best thing because you want to save that for the playoffs itself, try to get yourself that world spot. Yeah, so we will generally see people stick with the standardized meta if they are taking the game seriously from, you know, weeks of past. Every single land has got a land meta. Every single yeah. event has has got emergent picks or emergent styles of play that really do shake up meta on day of. We'll see whether or not you know these teams are going to bring it out. I doubt it. The the games, although there are <laughs> stakes, eh, maybe not the highest right yeah, now. We'll figure it out right now as we go into picks and bans. This will maybe be the biggest indicator of what we're going to expect here in game number one. Tartar Titans will be the first big team. And so there's an opportunity that we figured out in bands. It was pretty easy to discern that yesterday in the Bolts Dragon set. Uh, we'll see whether or not that is the case here for the Titans. I don't see a lot of smiling and giggling going on in the booth, so I'm I'm, I'm mentally preparing myself uh, for this to be. Well, these guys are all like hyper gamers, and it's 11 a.m. Oh, oh, yeah, good point. Actually, yeah. <laughs> yeah, if, look at the Kings. Maybe we'll see. Some They're just the shy stars. of the Leviathans. There was a point the Leviathans had a set at 11 a.m. and I and I was like, oh wow, you guys looked way better at 11 than we're used to seeing. And they looked at me and said, yeah, we haven't gone to bed yet. And nice. I go, oh, okay, <laughs> right. That's that's a good way to come into it. They went home and crashed. I imagine from that one, uh, the Daji, the set, the Cupid all banned out. Uh, I'm surprised to not see. Uh, maybe some more genetics-oriented bands. But the Cupid, the Kernanos, get locked away. Hell, banned by the Kings. And that's something that Paul has been playing a ton as of late. So it does feel like they're limiting some scopes here. And as genetics had said, Paul, Aurora, they, they said they could figure out. But when it comes down to, like, solo or troll, it comes down to layers. Maybe to an extent, Stu, a, a little harder to, to, to get the full the, wrap on. I don't know about Layers, you know. Layers has got a pretty defined god pool. Yeah. I mean... No, so really, it's just Solar Retreat. <laughs> yeah, whatever Sot's going to do, I think will set the tone for the Tartarus <laughs> Titans. I wouldn't be surprised if he goes towards maybe some of his more hyper-aggressive picks. Things like the Ool come to mind, the Tear as well. Uh, on a day like this, seems like SOT very apt to just Elegance do mechanical stuff in the this. lane. But this is the first pick that I think will set the tone. We'd heard it from the Jade Dragons up against yeah. the Olympus Bulls. They were not pleased in a low stake set that Yamoja got locked in. <laughs> this is a stake set, and the Titans have taken Yamoja first overall. I don't know. I think we might be looking at some standard smite here. Yeah, it looks like uh, I've got to gotta hit that, that polite reset button from yesterday on my brain. You'd think it would have happened overnight, but my brain is still uh, locked in those games. Oh, we're Ishtar playing and Smite. Vulcan. Yeah, no, this is this is not this is just isn't Smite. This is like this is Smite Smite. Yeah, we're 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 playing for money. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and now you personally can get even more invested. Even though it's not I'm curious, does it not being your money on the line affect your investment level or do you think that just because money's on the line at all 
uh, that it affects you. Uh, me personally, I I'm a huge fan of Serious Smite. Anytime that there is anything on the line, that's when it becomes engaging and interesting to watch. So I'm into it. I, I, I think that this is exactly what I want. <laughs> I was going to, uh, yeah, no, I'm going to just stay on the rails here. Ishtar, Vulcan locked in. That's a rarity, I can tell, yes. But it is still fun to watch what these top two are going to do. Uh, I'm, I'm still surprised. I mean, outside of the Emoja, it feels like we've normally seen, at least in bands, things like that, very heavy-handed support targets, especially against genetics and Aurora. My man's eating five bands every game. Yeah. Well, and it's that, that one saving grace. Aurora usually can get by a little bit just because Paul, most of the time, has been this, like, ridiculous lightning rod uh, for the bands, but... The set, the hell, may be targeted over towards him. The Guan Yu thrown a little bit towards Solar Troll. It's also worth mentioning, especially with Ishtar gone, Karninos, Cupid gone. Uh, those have been the ones that have maybe found the most success as of late, or at least been the most popular as of late. Rom locked in. And this is why you have to change it to most popular versus most successful. 8%, or sorry, 6% win rate. 86% win rate. 6% pick rate there we got go. it finally got there and the rom lock in i mean mid admittedly it's been mainly a warrior's pickup but i'm excited to watch Stu pilot this pick i think it's going to be fun to, to see what he can do with it I, I feel like rom's itemization is very strong right now i like the yellow numbers build for rom in particular and just stacks up a good deal of power his ultimate has always been just a phenomenal team fight tool whether or not you're starting the engagement with it just by poking out a vulcan three shots will drop him to about 10 15 percent regardless yeah. of some of these late game team fights Otherwise, finishing off some kills, also very valuable. Uh, no surprise that Rom's crept his way back in the meta. Ymir is the lock-in for the Kings, though. That is spooky, considering what you've already got on the Titans. Three gods that have got no inherent answer to the wall from Ymir, and, and the follow-up already being there from the Vulcan. Earthshaker just going to have very, very easy setups. Ishtar setups with a stun as well. Uh, I, I really do like the top three from the Kings, but... Depending on the jungler from the Tartarus Titans to really round out that mid 3v3, I'm not overly concerned with the legitimate yeah. mid pick itself. I, I think that Yamoja plus hyper aggressive jungle in general should be able to get the jump on the Kings. Could force a very early Phantom Shell, Vulcan, one that could really start to fall behind. And Vulcan from behind, we don't get to see it too often because it doesn't happen super often, but when it is happening, it, it is just one of the, the weakest mages in the game. Very easy to dive. Sure, Backfire is no longer affected by Cripple, but it still isn't a lot of space creation for himself. Self-peel, not exactly the strongest either, yeah. besides Meatball. So having someone that can just spawn up two walls around him every 180 or so seconds could put some pressure on the Kingsman <laughs> later. Yeah, it's not a very comfortable spot to be in, but you're talking about jungle picks, and I think that is where the Titans had their mind on as well for their bands, right? Lancelot, which we have seen Twig have some insane performance. I mean, again, go back a couple of days ago, he got two triple kills, uh, essentially back to back. I think he might've had one oh. kill in the middle. And then of course he had the, the Hunbats band away. Scylla and Erlong banned by the Kings. Osiris locked in. We've been seeing a little bit of that in the solo lane, a little bit of that in the jungle. Nice. So it's still in a, a nice gray area. But they close out the Titans, close out their five Mifflin. Kind of surprising me specifically with Zeus and Fenrir. Fenrir has been a pick that we've seen layers go to pretty consistently recently. <laughs> Loves playing that facilitator style of Fenrir, just going with the Ragnarok. Doesn't generally have the most damage when he locks in this pick, but early game levels one through four can really start to put some pressure on the enemy jungler. Generally, up against a Wheelish, you haven't exactly got that opportunity. Feather Step, just incredibly strong against your entire kit. Yeah. Brutalize. Not exactly an option. And post five, brutalize and unchained. Just gonna have to deal with that gravity surge. But with some of the recent buffs to Zeus, I haven't run the exact numbers. We haven't had too many opportunities to see it, but I, I believe it's like 10 damage at each rank of chain lightning yeah. and detonate both. Your combo is a little bit more consistent. You've got the inherent synergy of having a emoji on your team. It's not the exact same as like an Odin ring, but it functionally it is just about the same. Similar, yeah. I, I think it could be decent. And when you look at how the Kings are going to be dealing with Zeus, one of the hardest things is wanting to stand near him, right? <laughs> if yeah. you've got to deal your damage to Zeus, the Kings are going to do it through a Wheelish. It's going to be an Osiris dive, or it might be a Ymir dive. All gods that have to get right in your face, good luck. Drop your drop your Aegis shield, drop your chain lightning, summon the lightning. Yeah. All of a sudden, you're burning through everyone in front of you. I, I think that this could be like a red herring on the Titans where it's, Okay, you need to kill the Zeus or he's going to kill you, but 
in putting yourself in position to do so, you created space for Rom to start free casting. Amaterasu can create some space in that back line. I actually do generally like what the Titans have got here. It pulls the Kings kind of thin in the team fight, right? A few that are, are getting aggressive, some that want to stay behind. Could make a, a lot of trouble, especially when you, you start to consider, I mean, you know, maybe we'll see these Zeus buffs mean nothing, but at the same time, and the 3v3 outside of Vulcan, who admittedly, like, backfire is not a super long ability. Meatball, you can cast from pretty far away and feel safe with that one. But, I mean, the Wheelish and the Ymir, like you said, are going to be right there and often. Plus, Yamoja is going to be there, and you had highlighted that locking down the Vulcan. It feels like, at least as far as 3v3s go, if this Vulcan can live up to some of the, the damage buffs that we just recently see, or sorry, if the Zeus can live up to some of these damage buffs that we've recently seen, this could end up being, like you said, I want to say maybe even a sleeper pick, like something that isn't going to be number one every single time, but but similar to that, Scylla is going to be able to slot into mid pretty easily. Yeah, a situational lock-in. Zeus should have pressure in mid. Aegis Shield clears wave like at level one, so long as you're allowed to auto-attack it two or three times. But I think that the mid 3v3 is almost entirely dictated by jungles in, the, in this game. If a Wheelish hits the ground running, finds some early pressure, you could just sit on this Fenrir and in turn start sitting on the Zeus by invading red buff. But Fenrir has got the similar capacity to absolutely dominate the early as well. <laughs> uh, this one might be really chosen by whichever jungler is feeling better on the day. Well, that one's going to be fun to see. We've had some shaky games, some solid games from Tug. We'll see if they can manage it here in game one with Dave and Trelly. Trelly, it is our last first game of the day for, for, for the regular season. Of that season is, nine of the Smite Pro. A monumental achievement that we've made it uh, this far this year. And now our last cast together for the regular season will be the Titans versus the Kings. And as we talked about in the pregame, the Tartars Titans want to solidify their standings. You know, them and the only Warriors technically tied in the standings right now. Um, head to head, of course, big difference maker there. Uh, but a win against the Kings would set the tone nicely for the Titans going into phase three playoffs. Uh, and on a high note, on the flip side for the Kings as well, you know, they make some roster changes. Hasn't been the easiest third phase of the year. But they're a rock solid squad locked in in third seed. And it looks like both teams, barring, you know, Paul on a bit of a different pick in Zeus here, Trilly, putting their best foot forward in our first set of the day. This is an interesting one because we always see these supports go, go for go, the invite. Go. This time, Aurora and Genex just traded out purple buffs, and Aurora picked it up, so. Unfortunate, these ADCs are not going to be able to get some extra attacks. Supports speed. everywhere are rejoicing. Yeah, right? they're like, finally, <laughs> the invade worked out, and uh, we get some more attack speed plus some extra pen on these uh, tanky guardians. And it's, it's a different look, but, you right. know, this is a start that we've seen evolve over time. I'm excited to see how it goes. Paul going the Aegis and playing the Zeus, though. That's the, the topic of conversation. And, I, you know, I, his positioning is always going to be top tier. Right. But you got to imagine meatball into gravity surge. Always could be the danger. If it's an easy pull, and you're even with Aegis, you're probably dying in that situation. So Paul's going to have to watch that positioning and certainly watch out for wherever Captain Twig is on the map. You mean, is Aegis, in your mind, a big Earthshaker deterrent for Paul at this point? The, the threat of an Earthshaker maybe more so than lockdown and CC in Paul's eyes? It is scary for sure because Zeus is so immobile. You're, you're probably not going to be able to avoid that, but Captain Twig is going to bring the damage as well. I mean, Feather right. Step, so lethal, especially this early on in the game. I'm, I'm, I'm keeping my eyes on the Oweelix because I think yeah. Paul does. And this is a thing that he's always went to, though. Even when he's facing great CC, the Aegis, as long as you're able to watch your positioning and just avoid that massive burst damage, your positioning should be top tier, and that's the way that he likes to play this Zeus. So, again, I'm just going to be watching where he positions himself on the map, and... I imagine not stepping up too far if Layers isn't around. Obviously, Vulcan has been heavily in the meta here recently. I'd wondered if we would also see, the, even outside of the, the Beads Aegis interaction week we had there, for lack of a better term, I was wondering if we would see more of these big burst damage type mages roll through with the rise of Vulcan as well. Uh, now Zeus gets some play. Genetics and Yark continue to push their advantage. So the big difference here is just wave pressure over in the dual lane. Genetics and Yark able to get that wave pushed in. And that'll end up being their one level lead. It's a red buff invade though, early on from layers here. Deep in the Camelot King side of the jungle. That thing swings a oh, bit. Yeah. <laughs> layers is able to drop it and he'll head on back to base. But once you see it, it's Captain Twig invading speed on the other side of the map. So layers picks up a red, but loses his speed in trade. 
Maybe not feeling the best. And we'll see the sadness in just a moment. <laughs> Walks up, no speed, and back to the rest of the jungle that's also been whittled down by Twig. And, and see, that's a sacrifice that unfortunately Laird's has been happy to make. Uh, I say unfortunate because as a jungler, you always want to make sure that you have that speed buff there for yourself. But it seems like, hey, Paul is going to get ahead on this play. We're going to make sure BMT doesn't get access to his red buff. And Paul got to solo out his own. So XP-wise, Paul is just fine. Aurora is forced to use the beads early from the pressure from Genetics and Yarkor. This Ishtar Ymir lethal combo yep. has been pushing in the waves on this side of the map. And, I mean, forcing out the beads early on, that does give Captain Twig a pretty decent opportunity to come over to this side of the map. Because remember, Yamoja's one way to get away from a wheel is probably that Riptide, and yep. you can just get pulled back in once that wheel hits level 5. Looks like no Griffin Wing for Yark. Unlucky. I will say, look, I actually thought it was really neat how it interacted <laughs> with all three options of the one. Yeah. Unfortunately, don't think that's going to end up being a mainstay build. But there were moments where, where Zap was making the lob shots really work, the snipe shots, felt hit scan. Um, it was a really cool build. Unfortunately, just didn't grab the win for Zap. Bit more standard from Yark, Gilded Arrow. For, uh, for both of our carries here. And so now at level five, this is when we were talking about mid lane when it could get threatening for Paul. Twig has the ability to, to grab a knockup, meatball into gravity surge as well. And of course, you, you know, I mean, you've mentioned, I mean, not only the positioning, but the awareness of Paul that this is now the big threatening time. The, the levels five through 12 before those beats are active, positioning's gotta be on point. So blue buff dropped by the Camelot Kings. That's a successful invade. Decent deficit from SOT, falling two levels behind early in the lane against the Osiris. Yeah, I, I thought that was going to be a massive rotation. Paul and Layers were Looks on like the it. way. They knew the invade was coming through. But it looked like because Layers was level four, didn't have access to Ragnarok, did not want to step up there. The invade attempt from the Camelot Kings, but Aurora was able to confirm that one for Stewart. So at least getting access to his purple buff, finally. It's been so long before we've seen these ADTs actually holding on to their own purple buffs because of the way that the support's off to the start. But yeah, there is a bit of an XP differential, I think. Paul probably sitting a little bit ahead of BMT at the moment because of that red buff invade. But as you highlighted, SOT, not sitting not sitting too close to the variety at the moment. That gap is widening because of the continued pressure yep. on this right side of the map, especially onto his blue buff. Variety on the Osiris. Certainly a new look, maybe as of late. We've definitely seen variety on Osiris over the years, but recently been a bit different uh, as far as the solo lane meta goes and you know it's, it's sort of different because you talk about Osiris and like Erlong Shen out of the jungle and, and how you want and need to see them off to a fast start to really get things going I mean I can't imagine a much better start for variety out of the solo lane it's going to come in a different way than it would in the jungle you're not ganking as much you're, you're, you're hoping to out farm and out pressure so it seems like on pace so far for this Osiris yeah and I think that the Osiris is also going to have one job as the game continues, and it's going to be get to Paul, you know, get to this right. Zeus, and try and CC him, make him force that ultimate. Because usually that's the, the, the one peel option. Unless Aurora is there and is able to use the River's Rebuke, which a variety is not going to care too much about, so you can just walk through the walls. You're, you're going to be trying to force that ultimate, that Lightning Storm, early on as, as a defensive tool, and just saying, okay, we forced out the Zeus ult, now their team fight presence is down, and it was super easy to do. With variety having this lead, Curious to see if Paul's going to be able to match the amount of DPS you really need to force an Osiris away. Uh, with just Book of Thought, that's certainly not going to cut it. I think the way that this Osiris should itemize, once the magic defense comes through, make those rotations, and uh, the Zeus is going to have to stay pretty far back. Now, you know, I the more I think about it, so right, I mean, we're playing normal smite here. The Camelot Kings, nothing to gain, nothing to lose. Hope, we ha hope to have some fun. End their, end their phase on a win. We've talked about the Titans and how technically their standings can move around. So it does matter money-wise for the Tartarus Titans. But I, then I start to look at, okay, what are some takeaways I want? Sot just getting, <laughs> getting absolutely chunked. chunked. My goodness, level six on the Amaterasu. Actually potentially under threat of this tower being in a really bad spot. And Variety, honestly, if Sot got tethered and then took the extra burst damage. I wonder if Variety's fully going in there, but Sach is going to have to head back to base. Uh, but what I was saying, Charlie, is when I, I start to look at, okay, what are some takeaways I want from this set for both of these teams? I think both junglers in need of a, a pretty convincing performance here to end the phase. Layers has not had 
these crazy pop-off performances on a consistent basis for the Titans in the same way that he did in, in his first year with the team. Felt like a real win condition. He's been a consistent kind of facilitator type jungler for the Titans recently. Right. I would, I think Twig himself would argue that he's been the same, has not been the best player on the Kings, in, in Twig's own words, not even one of the best, you know, he was the 10th worst player on the map at times is, is what Twig saw it as. So I think both of these junglers in similar spots and, and in similar need of, of a good set. Yeah, I would say so. I and mean, because of the mindset of the Camelot Kings, you know, we talked about their, their seeding probably already locked in at this point. They, they just want to get the practice in because Yark still relatively new to the squad. You know, he has not played that many games. Right. And I think they just want to get as much practice as they can. And they're treating it as an SPL set, sure, but maybe as a scrim in that sense as well, just trying to build up more team synergy in that sense because they want to be making sure they're going in to these playoffs. Uh, in tip-top shape, and that's all you could really expect from a squad like that. So I, I wouldn't right. be surprised if this farm does continue. They're trying to make sure they've got the early game locked down. They've got a solid 2K gold lead already. I got to imagine most of that sitting on Variety's shoulders. I mean, he has been able to get two levels ahead of Sot, and it doesn't seem like it's going to stop anytime soon. The Amaterasu, the way that he's been able to itemize, and BMT as well, yeah. farming extremely well on that Vulcan. I mean, Paul's close, but not quite able to bridge that gap. So all of the Camelot Kings, let's be honest, just pretty far ahead at the moment. Yeah, it's the one, one, one of the 2,000 gold is Variety's net worth, and then five of the remaining 1,000 is Ting's. Big damage from the Earthshaker. Gravity Surge will not pull in a roar because the beads are there. Titans now rotating in. It's SOT out of the solo lane, a dazzling offensive onto Genetics, but that sets up a double stun and then a double wall and nearly Another double stun from Yarkor. Beads wiped from the map. It's Satin Layers at the end of that fight who have to use Beads to avoid Yark getting yet another multi stun in that team fight. Kings empty handed, but look convincing in the first scrap. Yeah, I would say so. They got what they came for, and it was three sets of Beads. Stewart decided not to rotate. Probably the correct call because it didn't look like the Camelot Kings had a leg to stand on. Balance of the Pyromancer back and forth, getting pretty low, but it looks like Variety should walk over and help out with a little bit of damage here. The first neutral objective of the game going the way of the Camelot Kings, but Captain Twig did exactly what he needed to do, get the pull back in, force the beads, and now next fight looks a lot simpler. I expected Paul to stay back, not be forced into using that Aegis, and that's what we saw, but also couldn't do too much damage from that far back as well. This didn't look like a fight that the Tartarus Titans were. They wanted to take, it was more right. so a fight that they were forced to take. And they lose a lot of relics in the process. Not to say that the Camelot Kings didn't use some as well, but much more aggressive are the Camelot Kings at the moment with the lead they've built up. I imagine they're looking to fight once again, once they have those ultimates off cooldown. Do you think we're unfair to the Totem of Ku? I'd argue that's a neutral objective. That's a neutral objective, but <laughs> that's like saying, you know, you, you got some... The, the Interceptor is also a neutral objective over on the I do side. hype up the Interceptor, that so maybe I, maybe I should hype up the, the, the coup a little bit more. I mean, I'm, I'm not immune to it either. I mean, I, I definitely don't consider it a neutral objective. And I won't. I'm not changing our, our definition of neutral objective this late on in the year. I'm I just bring it, it up because, so. because Variety, Soul Laners everywhere bemoaning the fact that Variety on seven straight coups has not been given the uh, <laughs> the neutral objective shout out just yet. But I mean, Sot, honestly, this lane right now feels like it's at the point where Sot can't catch a stray stun because there's simply too much damage from Variety rolling through uh, with the two level lead. But then you start to look at game state. So I was wondering after that mid lane fight, Trelly, if, if Sot, Layers, Aurora might be under a bit more threat in the next couple of minutes because their beads are down, if that's where Captain Twig chooses to go, if we want to fight around any of those three members of the Titans? Seems like yes, it's a possibility, but the answer likely no, is we're only 30 seconds away from the last two sets of beads coming back. Yeah, it seems like that was the the call, but maybe the Pyromancer was all the Kings were really after. Now it seems like with that rotation seconds. over Meso T, they're able to pull this gold for you real quick. Look at the burst damage though. 10 seconds on two sets of beads. That's Sot and Layers, they should get them back. Come fight time, but it's going to be very close. Shards of Ice down from Genetics, but Layers has jumped in. Genetics has been left alone, and the Chain CC simply too effective onto the Ymir. And now Variety can flex the muscles of the Osiris from Solo. A, ro a late rotation in means Paul is going to get run down, and now Variety 
is the difference maker at the end of this fight. And it's just a couple members of the Titans left running. Layers so low, but Layers will make it back to base. I think Variety and Yark would love a bit more. Won't be able to, though. It's a two-for-one fight for the Kings. Yeah, Captain Twig was showing me flashbacks of that, that Lancelot play when we saw Vote sniped him out. This time, Stuart, last snipe, dodged it with Suku. Almost got out scot-free, and it looks like the Fury will be going down here for the Camelot Kings. You get one pick, but I imagine Oof. dropping the dropping the lightning storm on top of Rivers of Buke, on top of the Ymir, with the Divine Ruin, even the meditation was not going to be enough yeah, to get genetics happen. out there. I think you're fine taking that trade, as well as grabbing the Fury in the process. The Camelot Kings, we saw that gold lead. It is going to continue to climb if they are playing at this pace. And my question is, who can deal with Variety? With the build he's got so far, does look like anyone. And now Stewart could be in some trouble, forced into the beads. One good wall might do it. Yep, great wall, great slow, great autos from Yark. And that's spot on from Genetics. And I asked Genetics pregame, how's the synergy been building up between, between you and Yark? Because the question is, you know, why do you make changes this late on in the year? I mean, your, your eyes are on Worlds, winning a World Championship. Do you have enough time to build up cohesion, especially in the duo lane, you know, where, where the micro plays early in the game so important. You're playing so closely with one another. And Genetics seemed wholeheartedly sure that, that him and Yark are on the same page, been playing ranked together, things like that. I think that's a great moment of, of clear communication between the two. Yeah, I would say so. And I think Genetics, another interview that he said, and I think just shows such a level of confidence. You know, may, many supports might say this, but it really seemed like Genetics meant to was that he has the best back line in the league. And he has full confidence in Yarkor and BMT. That's a solid argument, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, he, he, he has full confidence in Yarkor and BMT to do their jobs. So far, both sitting at 1 0, haven't died yet, haven't had to watch their positioning too much. And just being able to walk up. Because as a, as a support, it's the worst feeling. When you hit like this beautiful freeze right. or a beautiful displacement and there's no follow-up, Genetics does not have to worry about right. that, or at least in his head currently. Every time he walks up and sets up for his team, the follow-up is going to be there. And I think that's a level of confidence that your play can show as well. Once you know that you've got that follow-up, you can play so much further up in the team fight. And Variety will not slow down XP gain. Three levels up. Three levels up from SOT. And it feels like that's when the last fight changed. The Titans had that early kill onto Genetics. Once Variety joined, everyone from the Titans was left running to the hills. And Layers barely escapes. That would have been an extra one kill difference for the Kings. It really, really was a convincing look for the Kings uh, in the first big scrap of the game. That's a Pyromancer to the Camelot Kings as well. And an unsuccessful blue buff invade. Yeah, Layers has got to be here for Sod. Otherwise, Variety is just going to be taking that blue essentially on cooldown. You've also got a two to three level lead on the other side of the map where Yarkor has pulled ahead of Stewart. <laughs> King's in a fantastic position here to just continue forcing pressure. Luckily for the Titans, there's no big objective on the map now that the Pyromancer is gone, that the Kings can really rally around. But I imagine a lot of this, Trelly, jungle invades, milk away, as much golden experience as you can, though a rotation in. From the Titans, Genetics is going to get pulled back. Goes right into the Shards of Ice and the Lightning Storm the and the Ragnarok. You got to kill Genetics, though, when you spend this much. The Titans able to do so. Earthshaker just clips SOT. Aurora gets stunned out on the other end by Yarkor as well. And the River's Rebuke means support for support on a late rotation in from the Kings. Yeah, you don't want to lose a roar there. Sending five people over for one pick is fine, I suppose. If you're just looking to get something started, I guess the Tartarus Titan just needed to make that call. Looking I think a beautiful wall from Genetics. Make sure that you're gonna wall off the rest of the team and that fight took so long. BMT able to grab a tower in the process. So already the gold that the Titans got there essentially nullified and we're approaching Soon to be a 10,000 gold lead at this rate. It's 8k before Fire Giants even looked at. We're 17 minutes into this game. Another tier one tower is about to drop. I mean, this has been map dominance yep. from the Camelot Kings, as well as the, the, the levels are just, it's getting a little absurd. I mean, Variety is almost level 18 at this point. BMT also at that same pace. I mean, SOT has got two items to his name at the moment. It just looks like this Amaterasu can't hope to match up. Kings feel at times simply too good, too clean. This is a really good example of it where the Titans have said, okay, we can force the fight, we can kill genetics a couple times, but we are losing literally everything else on the map. 
And the, and the gold and experience still heavily matter this That's, early in the game. He so. lost it to an auto from Twig. He just sat and there then watching. stared at him. Yeah, yeah stared at him and watched it go down. That hurts so much, man. Yeah, if the rest of the game didn't feel bad enough for, for Sot already, a three-level difference through the majority of the game, it's a little salt in the wound, losing it to a quick little auto. And then uh, Genetics is the one who ends up going over and picking it back up. I don't know. I mean, if you're at this point, Trelly, I mean, maybe if you're the Titans, you're, you're banking on late game. Eventually, <laughs> Variety's going to hit level 20, and that's when Sod can start catching back up. But if you're in that mindset against the Kings, you're in a really, really bad spot because the Kings are, are so good at forcing every ounce of the game out of you with every slight advantage. The Oni Fury now smartly given up by the Titans. Imagine a gold lead big enough that Fire Giant's looked at here in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, I would argue I want to see Fire Giant by 20 minutes at this right. at this lead. There, I see no reason why you wouldn't, just because of the, the survivability, the burst damage, the, the shred. And it looks like I might see a little bit early because Yarkor not going back to duo lane already headed his way towards the FG. Only reason you'd have your ADC on this side of the map this early on is because you're looking for a play like that. There's no pyro in genetics. Looks like he yep. wants to start this one up immediately. Variety's not even here, by the way. He's still at the speed bump, and they're like, go for it. Who cares? No one's wow. going to walk up. Well, and th this is just so brutal, right? I mean, and again, maybe this is the right call from the Titans. Let's see if we can get any type of map pressure going. Should get a tier one on the left side of the map. But Variety, smartly hovering in mid, defends the mid tier one. Maybe a tier two siege from the Kings on right. Titans wonder what their consideration is. They won't continue up their push, those Stewart. Sticks around for just one more wave. Should be safe. And, and you know, it's brutal for Titans fans and really the players, of course, because if you're this early in the game and your decision is to already give up FG. <laughs> yep. I think that's you saying we're praying for a miracle Phoenix defense, a miracle Titan defense, but the way that this game has gone, it's a, a near impossible turnaround. Yeah, I was wondering how much itemization Paul could get online before we got to Phoenix right. Siege territory because Variety is already, in my mind, too tanky to kill. You know, like, it's going to take a miracle to shred through this Osiris, and I think he's itemized because of that. He doesn't have beads. He's not worried about the pickup from layers and pulling them underneath. He got thorns. Like, he's just trying right. to run down the carries of the Tartarus Titans. Paul's working on some extra pen. The Soul Reaper is great, but doesn't quite have that percentage pen that you would love to have when an Osiris is running you down underneath the Phoenix. So sitting back, hoping for a misplay. You know, they don't have Phantom Shell, so the Rivers of You could get some immense value. Again, Variety doesn't care about that, but Genetics has been the target. I was going to say more often than not, but 100% of the time, 100% of the kills the Titans have, which is only two, has been <laughs> on to Genetics. Still 100, though. Yep, so still 100. If they can wall them in, maybe they pick the Ymir and say, all right, now we back up, reset. Maybe they don't push 4v5, but... Looks like they're already stepping up to this Phoenix. They don't have a fear wow. in the world. Level 20 for Variety, just over 20 minutes. Yarkor, the same. Four levels ahead of Yark's. But we've given Variety so many shout outs, as we should. But Yark has also decimated experience against Stewart. He's been four levels up for a little while now, also at level 20. Titans stepping up around this left side Phoenix. Is that enough, though, to be the difference maker, the Phoenix damage on, on whoever starts tanking it up? will start to mount, but Titans playing clinical here, Trelly. Is there even a, there's a sliver of a, no, maybe not. I, I can't tell if there's even a, a tick of health missing from the left Phoenix. The Kings choose to go back and reset. Still a minute and a half or so to give one of these birds a siege. Yeah, I suppose that is a smart call. I'm, I'm probably walking up there, but I think the fear of the, the rivers was a little bit too much. Variety wasn't quite, quite grouped up. He was pushing down mid, and Genetics would have been the sole one to tank that Phoenix up with the Emp Armor from Aurora. Could have been a little bit scary, but Variety has itemized into the Emperor's Armor as well. Slowing down those Phoenix shots certainly will help out. I think the majority of the damage you're counting on in a siege like this when you're this far behind is from that Phoenix. But the Camelot Kings, they ran back. They tried to get here as quickly as they could. Only a minute, uh, 55 seconds at this point left of that Fire Giant, and they want one more shot, at least at this left side bird. Captain Twig and Variety still hovering in the jungle. You gotta bait out the rivers though. Aurora holds all the power here. Is it just gonna be genetics that's caught out? Variety feeling himself a bit. The level lead 
flexing on Paul. Three members of the Titans looking at Variety, and he's down just beneath half. That's it, Aurora and a similar fate on the other side, but the big prize, the left side Phoenix confirmed by the Kings. And a team that's as clinical as the Kings are, they say, look, we don't need this big team fight, we just want the left side Phoenix. It'll be down for another three, four minutes or so by the time the next FG is up. Let's set the stage and close out this game on maybe the second fire giant of the game. And, and that's not a highlight play, right? Variety didn't get any flashy kills, he didn't do tons of damage, what he did do was W key at the Tartarus Titans, forcing three of them away. No ultimates were used, and they said, okay, we submit. You can have the Phoenix. We have to run away because of the threat that this Osiris brings. The rest of the team also stepped up. Captain Twig was able to use that ultimate to force out a bit of the pressure as well, and that's gonna be it. That's all really needed. You get that left side bird. You're gonna grab the Primal Fury in the meantime and set up with this next Fire Giant. Because of the lack of teleport or the lack of global presence on the side of the Tartarus Titans. Someone's gonna be just on zone duty. They're gonna have to right. go over to the left side of the map, clear those minions out, and they can't step up to this fire giant. 4v5, I don't like their odds. 5v5, I also don't like their odds. They could have a six man. It still would be looking rough when you're looking at about 20,000 gold down. Trelly, game one, I don't like their odds. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I'll I don't like. I don't like much of what the Titans have going here in this game. And, and you know, so much of it, you know, it, it, it's a it's a macro game players like Paradise watching the Camelot Kings play this type of game. Now, teams yep. have beaten them. You know, the teams have figured out how to force pressure on the Kings and, and make the objectives undoable. But a game like this where you're saying, okay, it's Variety who in lane, you know, with a little assistance from from Twig, but, but really more so just kind of hovering around the right side of the map. Variety amassing a huge golden experience lead on right. Yark and Genetics making some nice plays on left as well. And then all funneling together at the same time, just around the objectives and forcing the Titans back. It's not this hyper-aggressive kill style. It's it's this continued map pressure everywhere. The Titans, unfortunately, just simply fell too far behind in lane to step up to any of the objectives. Ooh. And a meatball. That was just the meatball, man. That is so much A damage. meatball from Tings. Half-health Stewart. I have to imagine an Earthshaker <laughs> doesn't fare much better. Captain Twig fighting with layers. Beautiful by the shot over in mid, and Captain Twig will survive because Variety is here. Stuart, though, on the snipe. He'll make it a one for one trade. But it's not Twig we're worried about. It's this man right here. It's Variety who has crushed the Titans all game long. We'll end game one likely with at least a double kill. But as eyes for more in the back line, Stewart stunned. Stewart killed by Genetics, who joins the kill feed for the first time. Paul has to use the Aegis. Otherwise, Earthshaker meant death. This has simply been too clean from the Camelot Kings. A team who is locked up third seed, but playing like a first seed here in game one. What a sick wall by Genetics as well. Paul wanted one more kill before this game ended. Threw it up right between the Aegis Assault and said, nope, no chain lightning for you. And I think this Jameer has been on point throughout the entirety of this game. We gave our credits over to Variety. The front yep. line popped off, of course. And when your front line looks that good, of course, BMT is going to be able to chunk Stewart with, with a meatball, half of his health, yep. that sort of thing, all those plays. I think that's <laughs> clinical from the, from the Camelot yep. Kings. It just seemed like nothing was going to stop them. Troy, th this one feels like one on the outsides of the map, Genetics and Yark, massive lead built up by yep. the end of that game on, on left. Stewart had some nice snipes, but you're going into a fight at – just over 20 minutes with a level 20 Ishtar, level 20 Osiris. So you've got hyper tank yep. and then hyper damage. I mean, honestly, Twig, Tings, their goal this game was just to stay alive, farm up. They were able to do so, so they played their job uh, here in game one as well. This is a scary-looking Camelot Kings team firing on all cylinders towards the end of the phase. Are you peaking at the right time? Those are the questions we start asking. If this is a glimpse of, of phase three playoffs, Camelot Kings, we're talking about a really cool run for this squad. We'll see if the Kings can run it back in game two or the Titans will have it figured out. Kings, Titans, game two, right after this. There was something we were fighting about. Can't remember it, can't recall at all. 
Something about my mind, something was right, something about me. You always win, you always get away. No matter how much pain you cause, I stay. I'm always left behind, lonely in the night. It's a dark, I can see the light. But babe, I got a lonely heart. And I don't want to be apart. I just want to be with you. I always want to be with you, my love. Babe, I got a lonely heart. And I don't want to be apart. I just want to be with you, my love. Take it slow, just wanna let you know, ready to spend some time, I wanna spend some time, needed some time to grow, just wanna let you know, ready to spend some time, I wanna spend some time, ready to talk baby, can be your rock baby, please come and sit with me, or take a walk with me, I need to speak to you, just wanna be with you, just let me take for a ride is there a chance that we could make another try i think we're meant to be didn't want to say goodbye if there's a chance just tell me how because time is precious time is now don't want to take it slow
Welcome back, everyone. After a very commanding game number one there for the Kings, uh, we're now now on the precipice of well seeing what they can do in game two. If the Titans can bounce back, that's going to be a very interesting shift for them. But of course, other things that we have to talk about and something I'm very excited for. A lot of what we're talking about right now is world related, right? Whether it's standings for, for teams like the Titans, whether it's playoffs, or whether it's the cosplay contest that is going to be going on again. It is a massive, massive deal. Always one that I, I personally think is incredibly fun. Some of the wildest and most amazing costumes I have ever seen. And you can compete for a prize pool of $9,000 in this year's ninth annual SWC cosplay contest. Of course, you go to smitegame.com slash SWC. Uh, you'll find a lot more details there. But it's going to be split up. There's a master level, a journeyman level. So if you don't think that you're, you're like at the top of the top or on the other side of that, if you think you're absolutely amazing, they are separated so that you can have the, the competition. Prize pools are split between the two. Uh, so if you're just trying to get into cosplay or if you're you're you know in that area i guess uh, you would call quote unquote journeyman <laughs> then you can jump in and not have to worry about someone like that chernabog on the back of the picture uh maybe just coming in and sweeping the category that was an amazing costume and those of course wings worked by the way yeah no that was the thing wings uh, like for those fly. of you who are like oh yeah <laughs> yeah actually it was weird because i saw him use his ult it was actually global uh, I didn't think that was physically possible. This guy, he, I, I kid you not, <laughs> this guy turned into a shadow. Funniest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> was able to, to blend into the wall. Yeah, it was absolutely amazing. There's also other categories uh, that you can win. Creativity, craftsmanship, likeness, uh, the thriftiness slash greenness. So, like, if you were able to get a lot done for very little. And, of course, originality. And if you're not able to compete in that, there is an online portion of this that you can go check out. Uh, if you go, again, to, to smitegame.com slash SWC and try to get involved for yourself. The online prizes are a little lesser than the ones in person, but they're nonetheless, I, I like seeing the cosplays anyway, so do it at home. Uh, do it in person. Either way, I think we're all excited for it. That's Mifflin, uh, who's joining me here. And Mifflin, low kill count, high effectiveness from the Kings, though. Pretty much the entire game, uh, they just seem to have a good grip on it. Yeah, I mean, there there is exactly one thing that, that in any team in the league, this applies to all of you except for the Kings, the one thing you can't do against the Kings is AFK the early. Yeah. Uh, you, you have to get active. You need to be playing the objectives. You need to be on top of the contestable farm or, or at least defending your own buffs because if the Camelot Kings are given free reign of the map with literally zero pushback, they're going to take your Scorpions. They're going to invade your buffs. They're going to clear waves effectively. And they're going to split farm perfectly. And then you're going to look up at the 10-minute mark and realize you're 7,000 gold down for some reason. We didn't get a great look at what was going on in the solo lane, but by the time we did, I'd realized... SOT was just four levels down. So, you know, no no, no surprise that Variety <laughs> has, like, a crazy game, I suppose, on, on the Osiris pick. Uh, I had said, or hypothesized, rather, during the initial P P's and B's that we would have a game that was dictated by jungle. Uh, not exactly. Both yeah. junglers essentially just don't do anything. This whole game, it felt like. Uh, I believe maybe like 3,000 yeah. total damage from layers throughout the course of the match. Maybe about 5,000 from Captain Twig. This one was decided holistically by one team getting every single objective, every single tower with zero pushback, and then approaching Phoenix's, what was it, 15,000 yeah. gold up? That's pretty simple for the Kings. Tends to help a little bit when you've got that much of a lead. But yeah, no, it is very, uh, like like you said, kind of simple for them, right? There, there were a moment, I, I think even that first trade-off is Titans... Isolate, lockdown, kill genetics. Kings get two kills and a fury yep. on the back of it. And like that, it's at that, that moment where you're like, oh, oh, that's the kind of game that we're going to be dealing with here. And so the Kings look really solid there. We'll see if they can continue that streak in game number two. They are once again going to be second pick, Titans first pick. And Mifflin, this is where I actually wanted to ask you a question. You know, we've mentioned it on the desk a couple of times. The casters mentioned it in last game. And I, I just kind of want to get your your mental check on this. Genetics had said that he thinks that they have the best back line in the league. And going to think about it, as far as like a two pair back line, they aren't competing with a, a, a lot of, of heavy hitters. Like when you look at the Leviathans are obviously the number one seed. Zap sometimes has some pop-off games. Shinto has a lot of pop-off games, but it very rarely happens at the same time. I feel like we've seen a lot of hardcore and BMT simultaneously doing well pretty consistently i think that yarkor is probably the best backliner in the world right now 
I I'm pretty confident in saying that. It, it, that guy is just different mechanically. Yeah. So, big man Tings, he's, he's for sure, like, top three, probably top yeah. two. I, I think the only other backline that, that comes to my mind immediately would probably be the Jade Dragons. That's exactly like, what I was thinking. Panda Cat, Pay Panda God, Cat and Pagon are nuts. Pretty, pretty good. I give the edge to Yarkor in that matchup. I might give the edge to Pagon. Pagon. That's exactly what I was thinking when I when I heard that. Cause I, I was thinking about it, like even with the Titans, you know, we've had we've seen Stuart have some insane games. We've definitely seen Paul have some insane games. Uh, same thing, like Bolts, Warriors, like you, you can almost always count on one of the two. But that consistency that almost every time, like if you watch that team win, both of the backliners are going to be a very considerable reason for it. Uh, is definitely uh, a little more limited. And just the consistency that Elegance the Kings and the Dragons and bring for their dangerous. backline. It's been fun to watch, and maybe we'll get to see more of that this time around. Daji, Ymir, and Vulcan banned away by the Titans, changing up some of their bands up against the Kings. Meanwhile, it's Set Hell and the Cupid that is getting banned away by the Kings. Yemoja's the first lock-in once again for the Titans. And Mifflin, as you had kind of highlighted, it wasn't really... I mean, it wasn't heavily a frontline oriented game. I guess the Emir caused a lot of trouble for the Titans, well, but genetics was getting active. There was definitely not a lot from the junglers. There wasn't a lot from well, there was a lot from variety and genetics. Maybe not a lot from the Titans in general. That that was really shifting too much. So this Yamoja, I mean, still a good god to pick up regardless, right? Uh, yeah, Yamoja is like the best <laughs> god in the game. Uh, what is it like a 99% ban rate or something yeah. crazy like that? So. If you are given the opportunity to take Yamoja, you take Yamoja. Yeah. Uh, and if you don't take Yamoja, no, now everybody in the league is saying that team doesn't have a Yamoja. That, that's what it tells me. If Yamoja is available for first pick and you haven't taken it, and there hasn't been like a new relic that, that is released that destroys your walls and removes HP shields at the same time, probably means your team's not <laughs> capable of playing it. So the Titans taking it for themselves proved once again that Aurora is capable of playing this pick. It's just whether or not they can build a composition around it or whether or not the Titans just absolutely need Aurora to play a hyper-aggressive pick, because it's starting to seem that way. Feels like when the Titans have got Aurora on things like the Ares or Ymir or yeah. something that can just get in your face nice. and start the play on its own, approaching. that's the Titans at their best. Yamoja doesn't exactly fit that role. Yamoja is, I'm going to sit in the back line, I'm going to throw out some heals. Oh, you guys stepped too far forward. I threw my walls up. Yeah. I'm going back to my own back line, throw some Riptides, this, that, or the other. And in those situations where Aurora has to take a backseat, it's really on your soul laner and your jungler to start stepping up as far as frontline is concerned. So finding the opportunities to go in, finding the, the, the barest of moments to initiate some of these fights. And from what we've seen from, a, from layers in the previous game, those moments did not come off. No. Uh, you know, <laughs> or if they did, he wasn't jumping out on them. From what we had seen from SOT in the previous game, those moments didn't come because my man was five levels down. Like, no way you're initiating yeah. a fight there. So uh, I think I'm keeping my eyes on both jungle and solo once more. Bologna a little bit more consistent. I've, I've got some faith in SOT to be able to hold his own. Yeah, and that's the, the interesting thing. You know, SOT, you had mentioned it, but, like, last game, Variety just kind of wanders out four levels ahead and is then a huge impact player in the game because he's four levels ahead. And is able to do a lot. The junglers didn't maybe provide as much, and, and I don't mind that the kings are then delaying some of the jungle picks because of that. Especially considering where we've seen Twig. I imagine Lancelot's probably going to be banned here by the Titans because that has just been the honestly the shining star so far lately for Twig. Uh, the Naja, the Hunbats have all been very solid. I think last time it was Lancelot Hunbats that got banned away by the Titans, and we'll we'll see what they do with that one. Zeus. A lot of decent damage that came out from him, but but not a ton of, of control. Was that was that the Zeus fault? Was that Paul's fault, or was that kind of the team around him not being able to enable the Zeus to do what he does best? Yeah, I mean, when you look at the Titans draft, it's probably one of the more annoying compositions to have to siege into. So Zeus being able to throw up some damage. I'm talking about just Yamoja Zeus in general. Yeah, uh, that's pretty annoying. So him being able to put up some damage is, you know, to be expected. I would have liked to have seen a more concentrated effort from the Tartar Titans to play around their Zeus in the earlier portions of the game. You've got a decent counter matchup up against the Vulcan in game one. You know, throw out the turret, all of a sudden you've got an easy chain lightning target. Uh, you, you've got the walls to lock them in as well. We didn't really get to see that combo super often. So, lack of control? Yeah, that Zeus doesn't have CC, <laughs> right? He's got, he's got space control a what bit. What you're saying is bring Zeus's stun back. No. 
No, I hate that. Okay. Personally. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Just play play <laughs> around your Zeus. Play I want to I want to see the damage output because it's not as if Zeus needs all that he much time to school up. Boot. Sure, in the late game, he he's a team fight monster. Six slotted Zeus is one of the scariest mages in the game, but two slotted Zeus is also just gonna kill you as well. Uh, and if you build build a lead, way easier to play around it there. So, just get get layers something that can get active in mid. Put put them on like. I was gonna say the Erlong, it's banned out, but something like that, yeah. maybe a Robin, wouldn't it wouldn't be too bad. Now you had mentioned the Erlong, the Fenrir banned out by the Kings. I thought there were gonna be a little more targeted bans for the Titans, specifically into the jungle. They do get rid of the Lance a lot, which uh, I kind of expected, but the Horus also a a ban there, which has prompted genetics to to give the team a relatively squishy overall nature. Uh, the Kernanos more than likely going mid, because that's what we've seen from, from Tings. You got your Ishtar carry, which is not surprising. Hardcore just looked good on it. Hades for variety. The Baron now for genetics. I mean, as far as your frontline goes, you don't have the, the same hard bodies that was like a Ymir in the last game or the Osiris by the end of that. And definitely shaking up a little more of that. But also leaves Twig an open pick towards the end of the game. Hunbat's still available, one of his go-tos. Meanwhile, the Titans are only hovering a single god here, Mifflin. And Stu apparently is hovering over the Scotty for the moment. How does... Uh, I mean, uh, this has kind of been the conversation. After the Kern, after the Ishtar, after the Cupid, you don't really have a ton of carries to go to. So it's like... It's, Scotty number four on that list? I mean, I feel like that cannot be the next step. <laughs> CERN, Ishtar, Cupid. Cupid. I might give, like, Neath a nod. Rob, like, yeah, Rob, Rob, the Magical there. Hunters. Um, Kronos? Uh, maybe Soul? not. No, not. Well, yeah, that, the Soul, yes. Soul, yes. Kronos, no. Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of Hunters, all right? Yeah. On her, that's probably pretty fun. When do I when do I start to think about Scotty? Only when the Olympus Bolts are playing, yeah, and only if the set doesn't super matter. Entirely fair. Or that like one brief period where for some reason she was like meta, but only a couple of teams wanted to pick her anyway. And when the couple of teams was Barracuda. Barracuda. It was Barracuda. Yeah. I wonder if the Bolts are okay with the Scotty pick, right? Like, or are they if just everybody like, else, or if they just yeah, like, well, or they're just like, like man, man. Barrel's like team captain, so I'm just gonna <laughs> let him do his thing. Yeah. Who's gonna last longer in this lead? Me, who's telling Barracuda no, or Barracuda? There's a history there. <laughs> yeah, Barra's been around since day one. Yeah, I don't think they wanna. They probably don't have any problems with it anyway. I was also thinking of the the Danza Burrow, which is like the Panda Cat special. Like Danza is to Panda as Scotty is to Barra. But I'd argue Danza. Also, is just better, than, better Scotty. than Scotty. I'd, I'd, I'd argue. <laughs> I'm sure there is an argument. I don't to think be that had. anybody's going to disagree with you. Well, that's not true. Barra I can think would. of like two people total, and it's Barra and like Kitten of Doom. And T Money. <laughs> and T Money. That's yeah, it. there's the, the three people in Smite that are going to argue with you. And that's going to be a fun one to, to try and tackle. I can't imagine a Scotty gets locked in there. There has to be something else on Stu's mind. Uh, yeah, <laughs> like the entire Hunter tab. I mean, I don't have the God page pulled up right now, but I'll pull tell up, you, I'm just going to go look through the, of the them, next. Throw a dart. Yeah, I was going to say the next. Well, the next highest was Amus and Cobb. That's probably not going to go over there. Uh, but you've got your Charybdis. Oh, yeah, the Charybdis. Uh, your Chernabogs usually oh, that's another have been, good one. Uh, pretty high up there. Artemis, for some reason, is really high on the pick list so far. Oh, ye. Although, uh, after last year, I still find it hard to recommend Ho Yi to anybody, even though he's been having better performances as of late. Yeah, Ho Yi's cursed, because his individual performance as a pick is generally very good. Yeah. His KDs uh, across the league, across players, has been very consistent. When you think about what he brings to a team fight or objectives, it's pretty good. And then you look at his win rate, and it's like 20. And you're like, oh, well, maybe not great. <laughs> yeah, it hasn't been maybe. History just has not been kind to him. I also forgot about Medusa. Uh, that one. Yeah, I mean, that's forgettable. Yeah, she's very forgettable. Uh, admittedly, there's a lot of gods in the game. It's sometimes going to be hard to, to bring all of them up. A lot of mages as well. Very early Zeus pick for Paul. And uh, a little peek behind the curtain for those of you who are maybe wondering, well, what, what had happened? Somebody. And I'm not going to point fingers at, at who was currently in the pick. And I have the area. same info you do. No way you uh, know. 
Yeah, they. I don't know who it was. I was okay. just saying somebody. Okay, yeah, it was somebody. And it, and it had to be maybe the side that was hovering on their timer. Oh. Ended up uh, dodging the lobby. <laughs> you think they ran out of bank time, or did they dodge? Well, I think they ran out of bank time. If you run out of bank time, I'm thinking that's an L, personally. <laughs> personally. I'm just saying, I actually, if that happens in my ranked game, I get a 30-minute ban and an L. And an L. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess you do get the L. I've lost MMR plenty of times <laughs> reading stream chat instead of picking my god. You know what? I wish I, I would tell you more, but I'm not an admin. So that's um that's where we're at on that one. Mifflin, there's been a lot of gods picked uh, this phase. And this is where I'm going with this conversation. Please. Take uh, me anywhere. Almost to 100 that have been picked. And that's not including this week. So, so potential, especially with some of the flexes that we've seen. But really, we've seen a lot of dominance again. A lot of the, the things that were banned. Like it the item, feels, huh? Like the item dominance. Well, no. Because we've not seen, <laughs> we've a, not lot seen of that. a lot of that. I'll fact check you, Gore. Uh, yeah, no, I, I I believe you on that one. I don't even know if I want to argue. I would even attempt to argue that. Uh, just straight up, have not seen a lot of dominance in general. Um, but we have seen some of the picks dominating their respective roles. And so I, I want to ask, because Paul's on the screen, like, Zeus second seems a little egregious, like, even with the buffs, right? <laughs> it has not been since, I believe, season four, where Zeus was like, you want that early in your draft, Th that right? That Book like, of the Dead build yeah, the, last Oh, year. the Book of the Dead build, you're that right. That was the that... only other time since season four. <laughs> yeah. I mean... Taking it that early in your draft just gives so many opportunities to counterpick him, and Zeus is not a god, like, where you could just say, well, at least he doesn't have any uh, too bad of counter matchups. Yeah. He does. He's got some real bad ones. Have they? Like have Hades. They, I was going to say, have they done enough of them? <laughs> so I guess the answer is yes. I mean, you say the Hades, the Baron Somedy. So you have to think the kings are... Maybe are Baron a little bit less. Hades, though, that's not fun. Playing some anti-Paul. I will be... I'm kind of blown away. I saw the Scotty pick, and of course, like it was a nice little gag to, to run through and say, "Hey, here's everything that's better than Scotty." And like you said, it's the Hunter tab. Um, Hoagie was not actually expected on that. Uh, that little divot was just to buy time <laughs> more than anything. Uh, Gilg locked in. We've seen doing pretty well. You had wanted something that could get active early. That feels like it can get active early. The Hoagie, though, how do you feel about those bottom two for the Titans? Gilgamesh Hoagie. I'm actually a fan of both of those picks. I think. Gilgamesh is a playmaker. We've seen Panatom on this pick recently and what he's been able to accomplish. Lots of damage output involved very early on. When I think of layers, phase one, phase two, playmaker, get involved, like wave one, go first blood you on mid wave, yeah. wave two. Haven't seen that style of play from layers in a little while. This is a pick that I think yeah. dictates that style of play. If this Gilgamesh is AFK like I'd seen from Fenrir in game one, you didn't pick them for the late game, bud. You know, get active. You you need to do something. It's not as if Gilgamesh falls off yeah. worse than Fenrir. He's actually much better in the late game than Fenrir is because just ranged and gauged with uh, Wits of Shamash. But certainly a pick that you are not slanted late game with. And, and he's got some decent targets on the Camelot yeah. Kings. Go bully this Hunbots before he gets Fear No Evil, or even after if you can force it out in the jungle fights. Or go jump onto this Hades. If he's using the Leap on Wave, that's a pretty easy lockdown for yep. you there. Ishtar, get in front of her. All of a sudden, that dash is no longer an escape tool. So the Tartar Titan's jungler has got a lot of onus in this game. Whereas I think the Camelot Kings, they could probably wait it out a little bit. They've got a late game team composition with a double hunter draft. They've got pretty standard initiation and decent counter picks as well. Hades holds his own up against Bologna. She's not allowed to bludgeon and wave. Yeah. He's got great dive potential up against a Zeus. Lock him down. CC from the Hunbots as well. As far as the ease of play is concerned, I think the Camelot Kings have got it. Yeah. But as far as the early game is concerned, I think the Tartarus Titans, again, have got the potential to really, really run with it. Yeah, like you said, though, didn't get super active on it. But you highlight the early game, and like you mentioned, but like there's a lot of very squishy targets over there on the Kings that – the earlier you kill him off, the, the more you can set him behind, right? Baron, as we've seen in some of the late game team fights uh, that we've seen in the past when he's been picked up as a support have been very, very solid. Kill him at level one, level two. He's, still, he's just a mage, man. Like He's not he's doing squishy. much else. He's got Baron's brew. You know, he's that, a little he, bit more HP. And every, that's the, the benefit, right? The team gets the Baron's brew. Is the Baron's brew enough to, to limit a Gilgamesh, though? Probably not, right? I mean, it'll help. <laughs> it'll help a lot. <laughs> 
it's a nice little drink. Like, you get drop kicked into a wall. You need something to have afterward. True. Uh, we'll see whether or not the Baron's Brew is helpful here. If the Gilgamesh gets active in game number two as we go once again down to Dave and Trelly. Yeah, convincing. Even though that's an understatement. Game number one from the Camelot Kings, the Tartarus Titans, hoping to weather the storm a bit. If nothing else, last game of the phase, look competitive, potentially improve your standings, get yourself a little extra money in that back pocket. And Trelly, I mean, because we, we are barreling towards Titans, Oni Warriors, Phase 3 playoffs. Yep. Anyway, this is just standings-wise. Can the Titans officially lock in over the Oni Warriors? Will the Oni Warriors jump over them later on today? Unfortunately for the Titans, not a great showing in game number one. Uh, Wide-level gap over in solo lane. Eventually got there in the duo lane. So we've changed up our draft a bit if we're the Titans. But they also now... Have a lot of great follow-up outside of just the lightning storm from Paul and that River's Rebuke. Yeah, and it looks like once again, oh. the invade comes through. And once again, Genetics forced to pick up the purple buff. But last time, remember, Aurora, <laughs> the body blocks, man. He's going to make sure that Yamoja is a little bit late to the action. But last time, Aurora was able to steal away the purple buff and Genetics stole away. But this time, Genetics just confirmed his own. Which is going to hurt our core's Hurts clear, arc, I suppose. Yeah. And he doesn't get the XP, so he's not going to hit level 2. But Genetics is going to be pretty strong. That's kind of cool, right? It takes a bit, but it'll it'll eventually equal itself out. Well, apparently the wave pressure is still fine for Genetics and Yark because Yark hits level 2 before Stuart does on the other side. Genetics gets to have his fun anyway, right? I mean, this is a support pick that we've seen. It's not quite the on-her support. But I imagine... A bit out of standard for uh, for our support players here, and happy you get something a bit unique. Goodness, Stuart slowed for eternity, it felt like. Takes a nice chunk of damage and sustain in lane. I don't know if it's quite matching the Emoja, but with, uh, with the Baron, definitely brings a lot to the support role. It certainly does, and I think brings a ton of aggression in the early. I think level two Baron, just super strong, especially if you decide to get that wrap it up in level three, you have so much lockdown as well. So Aurora not hitting level two kind of does hurt the team fight a little bit. But I, the desk was talking about something that would help Paul get aggressive, yes, but also just that would let layers be able to have some early game presence. And I think Gilgamesh certainly does bring that. It's just a question of, you know, where is all this CC going to be found? Because it looks like layers did start the blink, doesn't have beats. And I'm seeing a fear no evil. I'm seeing the Pillars of Agony, and of course, Life of the Party from Genetics, all of which could be disastrous if uh, Lairs gets caught without his dash, that sort of thing. They just have a ton of CC for that pick. I'm just curious where Lairs will decide to get active. Looks like heading over towards the blue buff now. Remember that Sot got three, four levels behind last game. Doesn't want to yep. let that happen again. Yeah, variety on Hades, especially if that Hades is ahead. A terrifying thought. Captain Twig is going to be here around his solo laner's blue buff as well. Early damage into Variety and some lane minions following SOT from the right side of the map here as well. Blue buff has not even been started yet. We are just poking damage at one another. Now it looks like the Titans winning this initial damage trade. We'll send Captain Twig running. My goodness, this blue buff invade is taking <laughs> forever. Someone commit to the fight or the invade. Sot finally clears some minions. That'll hit him over to level four. On the flip side of the map, though, the King's invading purple. Blue buff dropped by SOT, and Big Man Ting's even rotated over from mid on it as well. And it looks like successful invade for the King's on the flip side of the map. Autos, one more, Yark doesn't have it. But Genetics does pick up the purple buff on the flip side, so maybe equal across the map. Yeah, invading that purple buff, taking that one away, and Stuart getting so low there. But good auto attacks by Aurora to make sure that the, the HP5 was ticking. Those Yamoja autos will help sustain him as well. And SOT, I think tired of getting bullied from game number one, decided that he was going to be the one to invade the blue buff and steal it versus three, as you highlight. I mean, BMT on the Cernanos does bring some quick rotations, was not there in time, and... Didn't look like this Bologna is going to be feeling too much pressure from the level 4 Hades anytime soon. But I think that, that really just hurts Variety, right? He's going to be able to, he's oh. not going to be able to clear. Oh. Looks like really hurt Variety. He's got no mana. SOT gets the solo kill. Wow, that what a comeback now for SOT. You fall handedly behind in game one. 
and then snag a solo kill onto Variety in game two. Quite a way to bounce back. Variety, no teleport, so he is going to miss. It looks like this entire wave as well. Two level lead for SOT. And maybe a chance to extend that if Blona can remain aggressive. Oh, yeah, she definitely can. And I think playing through the solo lane, probably something Layers would like to get into. I mean, he, he tried to invade that last blue buff. Didn't end up getting it. SOT stole it by himself while Layers was already gone. But playing through the Bologna that's got a two-level lead, no ultimate available for Variety for at least until this wave goes down. So it's, it's probably feeling pretty good, right? You, that's, Did he not level it? No, he's going to be able to go for it here if he wants it. But it looks like he hasn't went for the diamond just yet. Maybe it doesn't feel like... He needs any pressure. Yeah, he put the third point in Devour Soul, so extra confirmation for the blue buff. Maybe he doesn't want SOT stealing this one with Scourge. Yeah, you need it now. Layer smartly over to the right. And same with Captain Twig. But SOT happy with how things are going in lane. Doesn't want to roll the dice. We'll stay at bay and just farm up. Now it stinks for the Titans is, yeah, you get pressure building up on right, but you are slowly falling behind on the left side of the map. Genetics has had three purple buffs this game, one of his own, and then yep. two that he's stolen away from the Titans, and Yark has picked up the most recent two purple buffs on their own side of the map. Dual lane in a very, very comfortable spot. Genetics two levels ahead of Aurora, and Yark just the one level ahead there. But now it's level five for both these junglers. Big AOE setup from both. Potentially some targets to put pressure on. Yeah, it looks like, I mean, if I'm Captain Twig, I try to ba bail Variety out of the hole maybe one time. And if that doesn't work, I'm playing through Duo. I mean, right. it seems like Yarkor and Genetics have that side of the map on lock. We know Paul isn't going to want to look to fight anytime soon. He's just been power farming on the Zeus. Because of that one rotation that BMT made over to the right side of the map, Paul was able to get a little bit ahead XP-wise. And that Zeus is going to start swinging whenever he is able to get that Book of Thoughts stacked up, you know, especially from an even standpoint. Because remember, last game, Paul had to worry about a Fed Osiris running him down. This time around, it's a Hades that's behind and yeah. also building full damage. So Zeus is going to have a field day in these team fights if he's left alone. But Stewart is going to have to use the beads here for sure. And it looks like might not even get out of the coffin with the beads. Oh, no, the beads. Time out. And so does Stewart's life. Genetics on a simple pull-in. It felt like a matter of time. And honestly, it's so similar to what happened, you know, probably 10 minutes later in game one. But it's, it's a quick one-two punch from Genetics and Yark, and it's a kill onto Stewart. And that's when the duo lane felt like it really broke open. Luckily for Stu, early enough in the game that the tier one isn't going to be under immense pressure, but slight lead widening a bit on the left side of the map. And again, clean team play between the new duo lane of the Kings. And it's just unfortunate. Stewart knew what he had to do. He jumped out pretty much immediately, used the beads, but was still channeled back in by life of the party. Looks like a little skirmish over here on the left side of the map. Finally, Genetics is getting looked at. That's right. Got to be a kill here for the Tartarus Titans. Genetics will take too much damage on some good setup from the Titans. And it's Paul rotating over from mid. His first kill of the game on the Zeus. And I imagine we'll see a lot of that, Trilly, because we talked in game one about River's Rebuke, Lightning Storm, how good that was. And an attempted, actually, and successful purple buff invade. This time, Twig drops his ult. Misses the monkey toss, won't teleport into layers. So unfortunately for Stewart, another purple buff gets invaded and taken away. Honestly, it might be a good bit of the two-level difference that, uh, that Stewart's behind. But, but you talked a lot in game one about Lightning Storm and River's Rebuke. Now it's Lightning Storm, River's Rebuke, but there's also Winds of Shamash. There's also an Eagle's Rally from SOT. There's also a Ho Yi ult that you can drop in there. So much of the setup begins with a roar, but then plenty of follow-up from the rest of the team. Yeah, I would say if game number one, Phantom Shell wasn't prioritized, game number two certainly should be. I think Genetics probably level 12 would like to pick something like that up just because how, how easy even a target Baron can be. Uh, to all those circles that you were just highlighting. They've got a lot of team fight presence, and the Baron isn't going to be that tanky, especially since that Gauntlet of Thieves isn't quite stacked up yet. But the duo lane still does have that massive lead. That isn't going to change anytime soon. Just by way of... Stewart doesn't do much damage to the wave. He, he, it's hard for him to get that Dev Gauntlet stacked up as quickly as Jarkor. And it seems like Jark is making his home right at the tower line, like not letting Stewart step out even for a second. So I imagine duo lane's probably going to be looking like this for some time. Until that point, though, it seems like Genetics doesn't really want to rotate out either. 
is just <laughs> at, the, at the moment trying to steal away these offerings, trying to get that trebuchet. Both teams are one away, and finally yep. the Camelot King is going to be able to grab that one. But with SOT ahead, he, he, he probably should be looking to make a rotation over this left side of the map. Not anytime soon, but once this Gold Fury gets looked yeah. at, just because be. of the way that the Camelot King snowballed game number one, I think uh, having your Fed below to help you out on this side of the map where you need it could be a smart call. I mean, Sod is at the point where you can just proxy these waves. Two levels ahead, why not? Twig's going to get jumped on. Wow. My god, that damage. Maybe surprise Twig. Definitely surprised me. Variety will solo pick up the blue buff, but in the meantime, his jungler has crumbled. The Pyromancer is still 15 seconds away. Otherwise, that's an immediate pull from the Titans. Maybe fortunate for the Kings that it's not worse, but great rotation in and team play on the other side of the map from SOT and Layers. Yeah, Layers just sat around the corner, waiting for Twig to walk up, and perfectly timed the Eagles rally with that stun. Paul able to save his own red buff from the duo lane invade. Did drop Lightning Storm, that's a trade you're probably willing to take, assuming that a fight won't break out in the next 90 seconds or so. He's got good cooldown as well, with the Soul Gem in the same time, so using that, look at this though, the Camelot Kings wow. are just pulling the Fury. Only Steward is here, and he's just gonna run away. This is gonna be a free Fury Wow. for the Camelot Kings. I mean, again, I guess it makes sense when you have three levels of a lead on Yarkor over Stuart. If a fight breaks out here and Sot doesn't get over in time, it, it feels like mid to left is still very heavily Camelot Kings favored. And Sot just used the teleport to get to solo as well. So wasn't an option or was an option, chose not to take it to get over to the left side. So this is maybe where you would favor the Kings then. Sot with a comfortable lead over Variety on the right. Big man Tings out of mid. Both ADCs will stay in left. And a Pyromancer pull from the Titans. And if Variety's able to have a good fight, it completely flips around how the early part of this game went. But slow burn from the Titans and really non-committal. Wow, the Kings are just going to pick up the Pyromancer on the, on the back end. Variety separating out in this engagement. Use the Pillars of Agony. Gets the fear out. The, King, the Kings drop the Pyro one more time, though. Tense moments around the first Pyromancer of the game, ultimately dropped by both teams. Yeah, it seemed like the Tartarus Titans really were looking for a fight there, but the Camelot Kings knew exactly how far they could step up without getting too over-aggressive. Variety got the beads forced, but besides that, was able to zone for a bit now. A repull from the Tartarus Titans. Same sort of style here, but Lightning Storm is back off cooldown, and Eagle's Rally is almost back up as well. Detonate, certainly the best burst here unless Variety hits a massive Devour Souls. It looks like Variety's gonna get pressured away by Paul. I think this goes to the Titans, unless they want to look for some more. Captain Twig in. Three man fear no evil, but goes searching for some follow up. Detonate does good damage from Paul here. Twig stunned by Sot, and it looks like Pyro plus kill now for the Tartarus Titans if they're able to go back to it, but watch out. The big lead, Yarkor is rotated over from left. He's got an opportunity to fight into this. Lightning Storm has been used. Yarkor around the back side of the fight gets a stun onto a roar. Variety with Pillars of Agony does straight out. And now it's the carry from the Kings, the last bastion of hope in this fight. But Big Man Tings, he's in as well. Paul has a double on the detonate. Stewart from left rotates in late in a big fight win for the Tartarus Titans. Yeah, they're able to grab the kills after, but the Fury, or the Pyromancer rather, did go the way of the Camelot Kings. Pretty well, sure if Yarkor had the Aegis, he probably would have been able to win that fight, but he had Shell, pre-popped it for his team, and that detonate from Paul just did a little bit too much. Now you're looking at a 3-0 Zeus and a 3-0 Bologna. That's going to be really scary to deal with. I think more pressure is going to have to be put onto that Zeus. All the while, though, BMT, he was just farming. Turns yep. out he's a level up onto this 3-0 Zeus. Doesn't care too much about that. It's just that Captain Twig has no sort of safety, and once those... Once that leap is down, the aggression came through and pretty much gets soloed out by SOT because of how much damage this Bologna can do from ahead. You'd think that once the beads comes through, his safety will be ensured, but looks like Variety is still trying to fight, and Layers makes the rotation over. Sot is somewhat low. Twig just picks up a Hydra, so he's got a decent little bit of burst damage here. Fear No Evil close to coming back. Big Man Ting's rotating in as well. This Tier 1 tower on right. Maybe should go down for the Camelot Kings. Sot, get his back stopped 
Variety, look, Variety's been so far behind in lane. The opportunity to stop a back from Sot, who is uh, who's bullied him all game long, simply too enticing. Variety yeah. will indeed stop the back. Sunder connects on to Paul, as does two. life of the party. Aegis well timed, wild hunt. One more auto. Genetics is the one who connects. Layers feared by Variety as well, who reads the dash away in the Pillars of Agony to style more than anything else. And the Camelot Kings, a brilliant two kill swing in mid. I mean, this is just a great oh, pick. No. Yarkor trying to find the solo kill on a Stewart in the lane. He can't even walk up to his own minions at this point. This game was even 45 seconds ago. What happened? I mean, it just seems like. <laughs> there, <what> the, ha, <laughs> it just seems like the farm around the map does not belong in the Tartarus Titans. They're able to get their own lane, and that's better. Not Stewart, though. He does not belong in his lane. He, he doesn't get to farm. Yarkor is bullying him in his own jungle. But more specifically, this Baron pick has been working out so well. Yeah, the beads. I mean, being able to burn the beads and, and still stun. find the pole, <laughs> right. that shouldn't happen. I mean, on Zeus, yes. There's no way Paul can close gap, but Stuart getting caught that first time is just a bit unfortunate. Usually you can run a bit, get halfway pulled back in beads, and then zoom out of there, but Genetics has been positioning and timing it perfectly. I talked about the Phantom Shell. Looks like Genetics didn't care. He got himself a bracer, but yep. Yarkor got the shell, and hopefully he turns it into a Phantom one just to make sure these ults don't get dropped on the the immobile targets. And Tings wants us to talk about him a bit more this game. He's been an absolute power farmer, which you already brought up. Two level lead now over Paul. But yeah, I'm glad Doug goes back to it here. He was over 730 XP That's per minute absurd. a bit ago, hovering right around it now. And so we, you've had this really great lead for Yark over in duo. Variety has fallen behind, and, and, and Sot has had to kind of carry that mantle for the Titans. But then you got a two-level lead in mid as well. So both of your late-game carries spun up pretty early on here. 9,800. Now just crosses over the 10,000 gold mark. So 1.2K or so ahead of, uh, of Paul on the Zeus, who has also had a really nice game, but just power farming to a T is, uh, is big man Tings here over the last couple minutes. Kings find a way to get it done again. I, I thought this was a really nice early game from the Titans, specifically over on right, but it's a little rotations in, quick little picks here and there. I mean, the Kings are down in kills, but handedly up in gold and have extended things further. And just the, the neutral objectives as well have been consistently going their way. I think if Big Man Tanks keeps it up, he'll be 20 before 20, which is an absurd margin to reach as of 9-5, you know, a little bit ago at the beginning of this season. That was a good metric of how well you were farming, but it's a little bit difficult to find that farm as quickly. So Big Man Tings, you gotta understand, he is farming at an absurd rate. Yarkor, not over on the left side of the map, currently Genetics is. I was wondering if they would try to turn this into a Fire Giant pull, but Red Buff seems a little bit more enticing. They're close to another Trebuchet. You gotta imagine the Camelot Kings have it on the mind though. Crit already built up for Yarkor. He's got both Shurikens, which is gonna help out his attack speed especially his burn onto these objectives. And it looks like one more offering will do it. Yark was able to grab it. So where do they send this trebuchet? Do they send it out as they go for fire, or are they just so confident they don't even need to be sending it out and still go for the fire giant? That's the question. Notably, though, SOT still 3-0 on the Bologna, still a level up onto Variety. This double ADC composition doesn't appreciate getting boxed by a Bologna. <laughs> And actually, Layers doesn't appreciate anything that Variety's dishing out in the jungle. Man, that uh, that polyburst from Variety chunked a little extra than maybe what Layers was expecting there. Saw so with the Shoguns early, was able to mitigate a decent bit of the damage that Variety had been doing. But uh, unfortunately for Layers, Sledge is not going to eliminate some of the burst that this full damage Hades can do uh, over the next couple of minutes of this game. So we've seen plenty of beads pressure from the Camelot Kings, a lot of it from Genetics, as you've mentioned. But been there from Captain Twig as well. Saw a nice three-man Fear No Evil earlier in the game. And that playing off of the Pillars of Agony is usually a combo that we see some fun. What's the opposite of counterplay? When you're when you're working together. <laughs> Teamwork. Synergy? <laughs> yeah, the syn synergy. Syn that's right, the most obvious word. Synergy between the Fear No Evil and the Pillars of Agony. Uh, could pay off here for the Camelot Kings, especially around this Fire Giant. Though the Titans, remember they, Titans didn't have a chance to step up to any of the Fire Giants in game one. Sot wants to steal it away, won't do so. Eagles rally, simply too late. Wild Hunt ults 
All of them being thrown at Sot. The kill hasn't dropped yet. SOT lives through so much, and that's bought time for Layers to get into the back line of this fight. And another three-man, fear no evil, but two sent running towards the Camelot Kings. But Stewart suddenly going big in this fight. Variety's got a double, and it ends up being a three for three. Far from worst case scenario for the Titans. Yeah, Paul just doing way too much damage there. Getting the beads down, that's all well and good, but you gotta make sure that this Zeus dies before you try to fight into them. It looks like BMT and Yarkor don't feel too bad about this 2v2. No, They're gonna stand up. Carries. Yeah, why not at this point? Paul already used the ultimate, and it looks like BMT's just gonna steal away some farm. They have nothing else to do but defend this tier two tower and maybe throw some cl some claps out in the process. Yep. Are they gonna try and fight it though? I mean, I don't think Yarkor really wants to go underneath the tier two tower. Aurora already spawned back in and SOT has to teleport. Probably best idea to just run away at this point. Maybe try and take a blue buff in the process. But as you said, not a terrible trade three right. for three, taking away those fire giants. So where do the Camelot Kings go from here with FG on Yarkor and BMT, both their ADCs, they certainly can go for that Fury and still look at Tier 2 Towers. Yeah, I mean, a massive gold lead still as well. You know, you, you lose the Fire Giant, but really you've, you've still given yourself every opportunity to feel confident sieging these Tier 2s and potentially considering Phoenix Sieges at a later point. Genetics is, is I think, looked really, really nice on this Baron so far. He's maintained a pretty hev heavy three or so level lead over Aurora throughout the majority of the game as well. Aurora just now able to go back and pick up that second relic. And this has really been a set trailer where I feel like, and, and maybe it's just because we're in the set right now, I feel like I've talked about like massive level leads more in this set than I have in, in any set in the last couple of weeks. Normally it's like one player might have a level or two lead here, but we're largely equal. Feels like on one side or another. There have just been lane diffs going on all set long. Unfortunately for Sot, his does not last as Variety has officially come back and overtaken SOT in experience. And now it is all Camelot Kings all day at the 21 minute mark. Does seem to be the call. Yarkor and Variety pushing down that mid tier two all while this is happening. And it looks like a 4v3 over and left. Not going to be the easiest fight to win. Once that tier two goes down, the rest of the team should try to join in here, but I like the idea. The Titans were pushing up. They want to try and force that fight before the squad grouped up, but they are here, and Variety and Yarkor are actually in the back line. The Tartarus Titans are a bit split. Are they going to be able to defend this with the trebuchet? Probably not. I imagine you just retreat to your Phoenix at this point. These towers are definitely gone. I like the universal gamer like language of just running and jumping, like just a passive jumping yeah. while you're moving around. It was so funny. All the Titans, you could tell when they said, yeah, 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 give it up. They all turned around and just started jumping yeah. back towards base. Yep. Uh, like, <laughs> you know, it's one of those things, you know, they, they say with uh, like certain things you see on a regular basis, your brain kind of tunes them out. Like yep. the fire hydrant on the corner of your street, you see it so much that it's almost like you don't really notice it anymore. Yep. I think it's that with, Gamers jumping on their characters. It, it literally do it so often that until my brain like zones in on it, I, I kind of forget that it happens. But uh, it was just a funny moment where they all turned and jumped and ran away. When I first started playing, my buddy look at him go. <laughs> my buddy told yeah. he told me that <laughs> they jumped so much. Why? <laughs> he told me you could jump over Kraken, and then every time I got hit by it, he said you're just not doing it right. So I kept trying to jump over uh -huh. Kraken genetics. Might need to jump over some damage here, but it looks like Paul finally going to drop that ultimate. Oh, instead it's Stewart who's going to get pulled in. The wild hunt from over the wall from Big Man Tings catches out too. Genetics doesn't live long enough. Captain Twig has cleaned up a kill onto Stewart. Support for ADC. Kings taking that every day of the week. Layer's going to get run down by Twig, but survives with half of his health missing. Fire Giant falls off. Genetics maybe wanted to go back and spend up some gold anyway. Probably about 30 seconds on the FG respawn anyway. The Kings in a very comfortable position. Get one more Fire Giant. You think the Titans' base defense is strong enough to overcome a 13,000 gold difference, Trelly, at the 23-minute mark? It depends if Aurora can finish that Emp armor in time. He's working on it, but Genetics already has the Emperor's armor, and it really does start to add up, especially with the poly shots from Variety and double ADC auto attacks burning through these phoenixes. I'm not saying if Aurora gets it, they just blanket yes, can defend, but it gets a lot easier if you're able to m cancel out 
the Emperor's armor that Genetics was able to purchase there. If you're counting on, you know, River's Rebuke trying to catch someone out underneath your Phoenix, having it do the most damage it can, definitely the right call. You can take a look on the left side, you have the Titans nowhere close, so unless Layers wanted to step up and he's not going to be there in time, this Fire Giant will go down for absolute free. And this time, no brawl after the fact, so the Camelot Kings aren't going to lose three of their FG buffs within seconds of getting the actual Fire Giant. So the question now becomes, are they going to push up? Are they going to wait and try and regroup? So next on the right side, but no one else really joining him. So it looks like probably a full-on retreat towards the left, but at this point, try and feel your way up so you can go yeah. for it. It looks like Paul's beads are down for another 70 seconds. If Genetics gets close, that's probably a pick onto the Zeus. You know, I'm, I'm, I mean, th this game, in all theory, should end in, in the next couple of pushes from the Kings. I wonder what mindset this put, puts the Titans in, you know? I mean, you, you, you have your last game of the phase. Yeah, the, you, you, if you wanted to, you could take it a bit more lightly, but of course, you still had standings, had money to play for at the end of the phase. Hasn't gone your way at all. Layers forward, drops the ultimate, but the mid lane Phoenix already gone before the rest of the Titans able to rotate over. And the reason I say I wonder what, what headspace this puts them in, because now the only Warriors with a win today would jump over the Titans for fourth seed. And all year long, it's been it's been fourth place in phase one for the Titans, fourth place in phase two for the Titans, potentially a fifth place here in phase three on a very, very talented team. And they haven't had much to show for this set, where the Camelot Kings have, have simply swept them aside outside of SOT early in this game. I have confidence that this roster will uh, will get it together, step it up, put on a good showing at Phase 3 playoffs, in all likelihood at Worlds as well. But some figuring out to do, Trilly, I think, after a set like this. I would say so. Aurora does make a good call and take that ultimate for Paul. He knew his beads were down, but it looks like SOT getting chunked through in variety, just bullying layers, but is eating a bit of damage in the process, and Paul wants this kill, and he'll get it. Yeah, Paul will get it, but Variety has bought enough time for the right side and left side Phoenixes to get taken. Variety will call that one worth every single time. Takes away the time of four members of the Titans and allows his team to open up all three Phoenixes. And then on the, on the flip side of that conversation, Trelly, I think the Kings and their fans are on absolute cloud nine. I, I think the, the way their team is ending this phase, playing today, they add Yark. Yark has looked fantastic, has held level leads over Stewart in both of the games this set. In, in a variety of win conditions as well from the Kings, even in a set where variety isn't three or four levels ahead of Sot, the rest of the team finds a way to get it done. I'll ask, and I'm assuming I'm going to be talking to the Kings in the post-game interview if they think they're you know playing their best might, peaking at the right time. I get a, I get a feeling their fans are are feeling like they are playing their best smite right at the pinnacle of the year, right at the end of the year when it matters most. Yeah, definitely. This is where you want to be able to say you you peaked, or at the very least, you're playing at the best of your abilities. They're still down in kills somehow, but <laughs> <laughs> they have not been able to catch up in those kills. Aurora is getting absolutely shredded. The slow stance. Wow. From BMT. I was thinking the Rip would get him out, but he switched to the winner stance. Slow to Roar. Couldn't even get into the stance. Or to the Riptide in time. I, I assume the Camelot Kings are playing for EFG, but it looks like with three birds down and a pick onto Yamoja, they're going to walk up here. They're going to charge and knock on the Titan door. I mean, they've got two EFGs worth of gold and a gold lead. They're 20,000 ahead despite being down. I haven't seen that maybe ever. Down in kills, but up as much gold as they are. This will be the last of the Camelot Kings and the Tartarus Titans. We see this phase, and Kings fans thrilled with what they've seen from their team here today. A complete blowout in game one. Took a bit of time, but we got there all the same in game two. Swift 2-0 for the Camelot Kings. And your third seed in a very, very strong spot heading into phase three playoffs. And Captain Twig was able to get two kills, so he didn't go negative at the end. And I think that's what's important. The rest of the Camelot Kings all look clean. BMT goes undying. I think just an absolute farm machine throughout the entirety of this set. It just seemed like Paul was farming well, but then you look over, you're like, wait, BMT's up how much? Like, right. I I've been sitting here soloing my red buffs, running to farm consistently, and I'm still that much behind. Gotta be pretty unfortunate, and it uh, doesn't feel too good. But the Camelot Kings, they got nothing but good feels. Yeah, absolutely. Look, I, I think there are still, there there's Good things for the Kings to take, or for the Titans rather, to take away. Yeah. I think Paul has been playing some very, very good smite. Stewart has looked good at points. 
Um, I, I think SOT with a really nice lead here early in game two. So, you know, it's not a team that, that's in like complete rebuild type mode, but really finding their identity, I think, in the next week. We'll have a week off for Thanksgiving. They'll show back up at phase three playoffs up against the Oni Warriors. Uh, and that's going to be a very, very close matchup. Yeah. I'm curious to see how the Oni Warriors look later on today. Now, the Warriors have fourth seed to play for, a little extra money at the end of their phase. Uh, but unfortunately for the Titans in this one, nothing to show for it. The Camelot Kings, simply too strong. 2-0 to the Camelot Kings to start off our final day in this year of the SPL. Uh, we'll head back to the desk, though, to break this one down. I'd say a resounding way to end out the phase, right? You're going into the, the playoffs, you know your third seed. But being able to, to kind of give a little flex of dominance right at the very end, just to, to, to let people know. Uh, where you're at. Again, if you were the top two, so if we're looking at the Leviathans, we're looking at the Dragons, they only have one set to win at the playoffs. King's going to have to put in a little bit more work than that, but based on what we just saw, Mifflin, I feel like they've got a pretty good shot at qualifying for Worlds. <laughs> and, and you know what? The argument that Genetics have made about having the best back line in the league yeah. also starts to carry some water here. That's got a lot of weight impressive. behind it. Yeah, I mean, good stuff from them. <laughs> it, it was a bit different from Game 1 in that the Tardis Titans got off to a much better start this time around. It wasn't as if just complete dominance from the Camelot Kings from yeah. minute 1 to minute done. There was a bit of a comeback there, but oh, once sure. the Kings did reestablish dominance, they never quite let go of it. That gold lead just continued growing. And after Game 1, again, kind of showcasing it here in Game 2, and, and, and we've talked about it a lot in the past, but like you had said, can't, can't be passive in the early game. They were not. The Titans were not throughout that game, but you have to continue that activity, and it has to, 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 to hold up a lot because the Kings do not falter in a lot of these late-game objectives. Uh, and unfortunately for the Titans, that's where things fall apart for them here. Kings win 2-0, and we've actually got Hardcore standing by with an interview. That's right, Hardcore ADC, the Camelot Kings with me. This is maybe one of the most convincing sets of Smite um, I've seen in the, in the last few weeks, a fantastic set from you guys. And I want to start with your lane specifically because felt like dual lane was not much of an issue today for the Camelot Kings. You had a 2-3 level lead, it felt like, over Stewart uh, the majority of this set. How much do you attribute your lead in the dual lane to just your skill in the 1v1, or do you put a lot of emphasis on genetics and, and his play in your lane as well? I think it's just a team effort. I think when it comes to even just like see the, the picks and bands, we just knew that where they, we have like an idea, so we use like draft around that, and we use we fight when we're strong, and we were strong the whole game. So, right. <laughs> I mean, it was convincing. Uh, and and I, I talked to Genetics before the set. He was talking about he was hoping, you know, I don't hoping maybe not the right word. He was like maybe I'll play on her support, something crazy like that. I know you, you reeled it in. The set mattered for for the Titans, uh, and, and you guys wanted to get a bit of extra practice in. Uh, game two, the Baron pick. How much of that was like a, a fun style of pick, or do you feel like that's actually now a very threatening option for genetics moving forward? Uh, I think it could be a really like training like thing. I'm a Baron fan. When I play support, I play him like three or four games, I think. So I think he's really good in support, and he wanted to give it a try, and he played really well. I think he was top damage in the game too. So. <laughs> Yeah, yeah uh, it was not fun for the Titans to play against, even if it was fun for, for Genetics to play. Final question here, Hardcore. Going into Phase 3 playoffs, this might be a tough one. Is there actually still stuff you th think the Kings need to improve on before Phase 3 playoffs? A game like that, as dominant as that was, do you still think there's some takeaways for you guys to work on? Yeah, I think there is always something new that you can learn. I think we're going to have like a really good week of practice, and you just try to be ready for playoffs and what is next. So, yeah. Very good spot, dominant spot for the Camelot Kings. Congrats on the win. Congrats on the phase. Uh, the team's looking really, really good. This has been hardcore. We'll head back to the desk, though, to end this set. Yeah, that is, I think, a, a very good ideal and kind of mentality that the Kings have going into these phase three playoffs. I think immediately the first thing I hear in that interview uh, that catches my ear, and I think is a good way, is the first words that hardcore says. It's a team effort, right? And, and honestly, I think that's kind of where the Kings were, were maybe and they, they've kind of self-admitted in a little bit of a slump compared to where they wanted to be. Kind of hard to believe that third place is a slump for them. That is insane. Uh, but they were able to come out on top this time around. Two games in a row. And like you said, this one a lot closer. Uh, definitely a lot more fight back. 5-2 five, and 5 there for Paul on the Zeus. Uh, but definitely a couple of, of things that really stand out. 1-1 one, one and 10 assists that get locked in for Hardcore. A lot more damage on the board, Mifflin. 
Uh, but still, like you said, a resounding, controlling Kings game after they, they took the lead back. But for the Titans, I think there are a couple of things that you could say were, were good adaptations going into game two. I thought that Layers is doing a much better job of getting involved throughout the early portions of the match, was able to actually have a bit of impact. Unfortunately, four Layers falls behind because he doesn't get any of the kills. I believe it was 0-0-5 at one point, had any of those assists become kills. Likely would have been able to do a little bit more with that Gilgamesh. Otherwise, the composition looks a bit better. SOT has a much better time in the laning phase, actually finding a solo kill up against Variety as well. But the Camelot Kings have always been a team that aren't playing for laning phase, except yeah. for Yark. That guy's playing for laning phase, and he's doing it really, really well. But the other four men uh, generally have got their eyes set a little bit more so towards that neutral farm, the contestable farm. And when they are allowed to do it, they look real good doing that. Well, and if I'm, unless my math is, is absolutely terrible, and it's not even my math, I've got robots doing it for me. Uh, but I believe now, because of the, the plus minus, even if the, the Warriors end up losing this next set, they've still got... Uh, the plus minus, the head-to-head -head is actually tied between them and the Titans, but that, that one little number towards the end uh, puts them just ahead. So depending on this next set, I think they could win and be more secured in their spot. Uh, but things have been going pretty well for them, and that means that they technically get fourth place now. We can look at the schedule, of course, the standings if you're, you're curious as to what I'm talking about. The Titans losing here. Warriors will be playing the Scarabs next. And I'll say we got a little hint as to what that set's going to look by look like in that Cuvo and Sam were playing ping pong before I walked in uh, to do this death segment. And so a little bit of rivalry already building up there for the Warriors and the Scarabs. What rivalry there can be. And then the Valkyries and the Bolts will play later, and that'll close out Phase 3 in totality before we kick off to the, the playoffs in 10 days after a nice little week break. This is where the standings are at, and, and for the most part, it's far as I'm concerned, this is where they're going to stay again, even well, with a loss, I believe. The Valks could, could leapfrog the Scarabs, yeah, I the, Oh, yeah, you've got a good point. It's, it's you know, 7th, 8th might be changing, uh, but as far as, uh, the you know, like we said, the team's going to playoffs, everything's secured. The top six locked in. And I'm thinking we've, we've got, admittedly, uh, I think the break necessary. Everybody, nice little mental reset, but but I'm really excited for the playoffs now that I, like, like it's, it's gotten closer. It feels, like, tangible. I mean, it's the last day of the phase. Uh, I don't want to freak you out too much, but, but like playoffs it, it are coming is, up. It's like 10 days away. Quite literally, very close to getting some very high-stakes smite. I will give you at least this tidbit. Yeah, I had okay. the opportunity to speak with the Oni Warriors, and uh -huh. they had uh, expressed that they weren't quite happy with the Jay Dragons performance yesterday. Would have preferred that they take it seriously because that set had implications for the Warriors. Yep. So the Warriors have assured me that they will be coming out swinging today. So we've got another good one coming up. I'm excited to see it. Whatever the Warriors have uh, to offer us, especially with the Scarabs. I mean, you have to think of the Scarabs right now are trying to prepare themselves for Worlds. They, they don't have that playoff hopes, but they are looking for that long performance. And, and admittedly, once again, having two changes, you know, we've gotten confidence from them as well as confidence in, in tweets from interviews, all sorts of stuff like that, that they – feel pretty good about their abilities at Worlds. We'll have to see what they have to offer for us between them, the Warriors, and of course, again, leader, the Valkyries, and the Bolts. But all of that is going to be coming up after this quick break. But before we can even jump into that, I think Mifflin went to, he, he abandoned me on the desk, y'all. I'm going to be real with you. I don't know where he's going. He looked at me and said, I have something I've got to go do. <laughs> and has just left me here. I've kind of run out of the things I wanted to talk about with you, so we'll instead just hang around for a little bit. Talk about implications. Never mind, we don't have to talk about that anymore. I got saved. Perfect timing. Uh, Mifflin, wherever he abandoned me to leave me here, is now ready to take it from me there. 